6, 2007, with a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very much. Uh, will the town clerk read the roll? Councillor Edwards? Here. Councillor Medeiros? Here. Councillor Durfee? Here. Councillor Carroll? Here. Councillor Costa? Yeah. Councillor Bolin? Yeah. And Councillor Ruder is absent. Thank you very much. It was well read. <laughs> and Mr. Bolin, would you kindly read the Arbor Day proclamation? Arbor, Arbor Day proclamation. Whereas the holiday called Arbor Day was first observed in 1872 with the planting of more than one million trees in Nebraska, and whereas Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and world, and whereas trees can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, lowering our heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce oxygen, and provide habitat for wildlife, and whereas trees are a renewable resource giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and countless other wood products. And whereas trees, wherever they are planted, are a source of joy and spiritual renewal, as well as economic vitality and beautification of our community. Therefore, be it resolved that the Tiverton Town Council does hereby proclaim Friday, April 27, 2007, in the town of Tiverton as Arbor Day, and urges all citizens to celebrate Arbor Day by supporting efforts to protect our trees and woodlands and to plant and care for trees to promote the well-being of this and future generations. Adopted by the Town Council of the Town of Tiverton, Rhode Island, this 26th day of March, 2007. Motion. Motion has been made. Second. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, the proclamation, raise your right hand. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. And would you kindly read the consent agenda? Tonight's consent agenda consists of the minutes of the regular council meeting, March 12, 2007, receipt of minutes from the following boards and commissions, the Art Commission, the Planning Board, three sets, Substance Abuse Task Force, Planning Board of Appeals, Conservation Commission, Tree Commission, Historical Cemetery Commission, and the Zoning Board. Correspondence received from Mrs. Kimberly Walsh regarding Shore Road received from City of Pawtucket regarding resolution supporting an act relating to fish and wildlife Menhaden management area. Received from Town of Boroughville regarding council resolution relating to opposition of privatization of food and housekeeping services at all in the Slater Hospital. One received from the Town of Hopkinton regarding resolution relating to school housing projects, cost and group home educational funding. Received from the Town of Portsmouth resolution regarding school housing project costs and group home educational funding. Received from Rhode Island DEM regarding priority list request for projects state fiscal year 2008 referred to town administrator. Received from the Armenian National Committee of Rhode Island regarding Armenian flag. Received from Betty Jerome regarding Nonquit Pond. Received from town treasurer regarding full-time position. Uh, tax assessor Dave Roberts requests approval of abatements. Uh, Tiverton Fire Chief Chief Floyd requests interdepartmental transfer of $1,319 from account 331105 holidays to account 331106 longevity. The Tiverton Fire Department Chief Floyd requests interdepartmental transfer of $12,000 from account 331101 base salary to account 331102 overtime. And the tax assessor Dave Rabbit's memo regarding update of property value assessment. And that's tonight's consent agenda. Are there any withdrawals? Yes. Uh, 3H, I have a brief comment, Madam President. Okay. 3H. <coughs> Madam uh, President, uh, item 4, 3V, from the City of Pawtucket, regarding the resolution of an act related to Fish and Wildlife Manhattan Management. Okay. Anything else? Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries. No, you're not up. No, I think Mr. <laughs> Mr. Costa. 3B. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I requested 
I requested this be um, taken off the consent agenda to allow for a presentation by a gentleman who wishes to address the subject, Mr. Guimon. Yeah, you can go right up to that microphone. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and Mr. President, Mr. Jeffy. I'm here basically as a fisherman, but representing an arc bait company who's been catching Manhattan for over 30 years, and I've bought bait from them for 30 years. What's happened in the past is that uh, there was never really any problem them catching bait. Uh, the sportsmen over in Warwick, there's a couple of angler clubs, and when we used to have, uh, some of you people might have seen them in the bay years ago, the big green boats, they used to come up from Chesapeake Bay. So the sportsmen in Ark Bay got together and they managed to get the big boats out of the bay. And then the next thing, the sportsmen managed to get Ark Bay out of a big area over at Greenwich and they, tra they, get, they traded off. Now what they're trying to do is basically close all of Narragansett Bay and they've been sending uh, emails to all the towns to vote against this. There was a meeting in Little Compton uh, uh, the other night and they voted against it because what, it, what they do is they do supply lobster bait to over 250 boats in, in Rhode Island, Point Judith, Newport, Sakana Point, some in Westport, and some as far as Connecticut. But the Menhaden is the best bait as far as lobsters or crabbing. I've been crabbing for the past 13 years, these red crabs that are out in two to three hundred fathom. And basically, we bring in 60, 70,000 pounds that goes to New Brunswick, Canada. And first of all, the Menhaden is something that never exists, that generates money, there's 15 families working off that boat. And without that boat, my bait would go from $40 for 400 pounds to $80, where I've had to buy it out of Cape May. But the biggest thing is, like, my crabs, when I ship the crabs, I have two tractor trailers come down from New Brunswick, Canada, and they buy the crab. And that crab comes back to the state of Rhode Island, the money is wired right to a Rhode Island bank. I have six people on the boat, and I have a captain with five children, and there's six, five deckhands. My insurance company is in Rhode Island, my mortgage is in Rhode Island. I mean, it's a thing where it comes right down to putting food on your table. And this money never existed till we went out and brought it back into the state. And what the sportsmen want to do is close the whole bay so they can go out fishing. It's recreation and it's very nice for them to have the time. But where we depend on a living, and you've got it in fact in a play of all the boats and all the fish and the lobsters, they're talking about lobster and then they're saying, well, we might get charred boats come in the bay, but they're not looking at the tourism in Newport for lobsters, all the restaurants for lobsters. If we have to buy our bait out of the state, that's money leaving the state, not staying in the state. And everything else, it's once again, uh, it's all gonna come down to, the, it comes right down to putting food on the table. And a lot of their reasons for closing is basically they're selfish and they want the whole thing. But they were willing to work together with our bait who's been doing this for over 30 years. And I brought bait right from the day, uh, we encouraged them to go into business because we had trouble getting bait. But it's something that uh, the town of Little Compton voted against it. And I know uh, Portsmouth and Newport and uh, Bristol, Warren, all the towns that have fishermen that do lobster, it's basically coming out of the sports. And another thing they've been doing is, sport boats have gone up to them for years and they've never refused any sport boat any bait they needed, whether it was 50 pounds, 100 pounds, they gave it to them, just to work alongside of them. I mean, the big man in boats used to come in and take two or three million pounds a day. They can only carry like 150,000 pounds. They have a plane that spots for them, and I mean, before they, they can go in and cut out just what they need, and they don't, you know, do anything else. I mean, if, then they don't want them going up the Providence River. The Providence River right now is, uh, the Manhattan do go up there, but there's a lot of fish killed because of the, the water's not the greatest. But the biggest thing is I'm asking for the support of the town council if they would vote, vote against this, that they uh, allow Ark Bay to continue fishing in Narragansett Bay. And they have given up uh, Greenwich, and I, I can't tell you all the areas. And they're even willing to compromise some more, but uh, they basically, uh, the computer's done a wonderful thing for people to communicate. 
And they're, going, they're sending it to towns way up that doesn't, it's not even near the water. But it's basically coming out of Warwick and it's just a battle that we need uh, financially. It's money and lives and the lives of everybody. If you got 250 votes and there's even just three men on a boat. But I mean, you take my boat, I got five men, the captain's got five children. They all have mortgages, car insurance, trucks, fuel, bait, groceries. I mean, it's it's all the economy and uh, what, what works. And the insurance is getting higher and higher. When I tripped over to Y, he said he didn't want a lawsuit. Let me tell you, I mean, it cost me over $80,000 a year just to insure the boat. And I'm pulling the engine out right now between the engine and reduction. It's going to be almost $60,000 to rebuild. and. Uh, because now's the only time to do it because it's a slow season. <coughs> Madam President, may I ask a few questions? Yes. Uh, <coughs> with regards to the manner that they, they scooped the bay for this Manhattan, uh, aren't there uh, uh, nets that are opened uh, to a size that allows for young Manhattan to pass through, and it's only the aged Manhattan that they normally pull out of the bay. Is that a fact? That, that, that's true, uh, uh, Mr. Hannibal. And also, with regards to the ability of Manhattan to furnish oxygen to the bay, isn't it also true that those Manhattan that pass through do the job just as well as the male? Well, after, the you get them in the bay for maybe two months, two and a half, it looks like this year might be a good year. After the majority of the big Manhattan leave the bay, you have millions and millions of small Manhattan. And they produce and, and filter more oxygen and filtering than they do the, the largest big schools because there's billions of them. And they don't bother with them. They're too small. They wouldn't want them. We would go after the large ones. Cause it, it, and for red crab, and I mean, that's, that's, we pull our traps every day. That's the best bait we can get. And, the nearest bait we can get it would be out of Chesapeake or Cape May, and uh, then with price, prices double, and it's a situation where we uh, get it right here. Hey, thank you. I'm wondering if we should probably ask the Harbor Commission or the, and the Conservation Commission for their advice on this. I must say, I. Uh, for every person that will appear before us, there's probably a, a person in opposition or supporting of this legislation, so. Um, Madam President, can I suggest this was only on the agenda for, to receive the correspondence? We, yeah. uh, we make the motion to receive the correspondence and, and not take action because that wasn't on the agenda in any case, so we're not, we would not be approving the resolution. I appreciate you just listening to me. I have a letter here. I belong to the Tivin and Rod and Gun Club, okay. and they support it. And they, we had a meeting about it, and they voted on it. And would you like a copy? Yes, of it? I have we'll a copy. Oh, you have yeah. Town clerk will circulate that to all of us. Hi, right, thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, we'll make a motion. I don't I'll, know. Go ahead. I'll no. make a motion that we receive the correspondence from the city of Pawtucket regarding resolution supporting an act relating to fish and wildlife in the Hayden management area. Second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries. Home stain. All we did was receive it. We did receive uh, it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Include me in that. Now, uh, Hannibal, you had another item. No. No. Mr. Amaranth. Mr. Amaranth. Right. Yes. Okay. You're on. Uh, Madam President, uh, James Amaranthy's town treasurer. Uh, the uh, resignation date in my letter was predicated uh, on uh, a, a full-time person being appointed by that date, August 31st, 2007. But I understand, uh, I've been away on vacation, I understand that budgetary constraints uh, uh, may preclude that from happening. Uh, so I'm meeting with Glenn uh, to go over dates and funding issues, and I would ask that the matter either be tabled or continued until we sort it out. Thank you. Perhaps it should be tabled. Once again, it's, it's correspondence, and we received yeah, the correspondence. Received the correspondence. Yes. Had the motion to receive the correspondence, and no action to be taken because it's not a matter for a vote That's fine. on our agenda. Second. All those in favor? 
Okay, I will open the uh, public hearing in connection with a uh, the on-site wastewater management section 18-6501 and the addition of a new section 18-6702 entitled variances. Um, we had discussed this at a workshop and I think the council advertised the proposal uh, as you see it, which is 6505 um, for hearing as well as a extended option which is labeled X on page two. So I will open the public hearing for anyone who wishes to be heard on this matter. Is there anybody who wishes to be heard on this matter? Hey, Madam Chairman, mm -hmm. yeah, you gonna hold it for the council or? Uh, yeah. uh, well, I'll just wait until we get the public okay. um, and then we'll <coughs> open it up for the council. Yes. Uh, uh, is this about the cesspools of this new law? Uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to ask a few questions about this. Yes. Uh, I've been a resident uh, of Campion Avenue for almost 40 years in Tiverton, and uh, the house I live in was built in 55. Can in I Allen. just interrupt you a moment? Your name as well, well as My name name. is Alan Chapman. Uh, I live at 45 Campion Avenue and in Tiverton, and um, I own a house also on 63 Campion Avenue that I've had up for sale. And uh, there is nothing wrong with the house. I've had two offers on it, and the offers have been retracted because of the fact that uh, uh, this house, this particular house has a cesspool, and the buyers don't want to get involved with replacing the uh, septic system which is a gray area because I've been up here to the building inspector and several people in the town hall. There's not too much known about what has to happen. But lately I've uh, done some investigating about this. Now, my understanding of this is I would have to see a civil engineer have a, a, a new system drawn up for this house that has a cesspool and then submit it to the state and then the state would have to come down and okay it and then I would have to, uh, I'd have to put out 1600 to $2,000 for the survey and then have a contractor come in anywhere from 10500 to $20,000 to upgrade the system. Uh, I'm on a fixed income. I don't know if any of you people ever have been. If this system was good 45 years ago and okayed by the city and uh, by the town and the state, why all of a sudden now that we have to change this if we don't have the money? I understand there's low income, uh, uh, the low interest uh, rates for this, but the fact is, what if there's no room to take this loan? I can't sell the property. What do I do with the house? Give it to the town? Can we back up a little bit? Sure. Okay. I'm willing to listen to what's got to be done. Well, uh, just, uh, just get some facts from your situation. That's what I'm here for. Okay. Was this on the market on January 1st? Before that, it's been on the market for about a, a little over a year now. Okay. So, under this proposal that we are talking about, you are exempt. I am, but not the new owner. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. So, I think a careful reading of what that section does um, would 
you are exempt under the proposed ordinance. You are, and the buyer is. Okay. Do you want me to read it to you? But, Matt, I, Matt, I have a copy of that sent to me by the town hall, by the town clerk. Okay. M and I Madam submitted President. it to my realtor, and they submitted it to the buyer, and the buyer does not want anything to do with this because what, what is there, a 10-year moratorium? Does it have to be changed? I, I, I don't know the particulars, no. but eventually a cesspool will have to be changed, correct? But the situation, Madam President, I think that it causes the confusion in this is part of the ordinance also calls for an inspection program to start starting in the watershed area and continuing throughout the town. I think the problem is that there are people, and it's not the problem with the ordinance, it's a problem with potential buyer, and I can understand where they're coming from. If we're going to start an inspection program, and during this inspection program, it's to get cesspools upgraded to septic systems that are failing or failed, uh, there's the potential that somebody buys a house, it's been exempt under this thing because it was on the market prior to January, and if a year from now we go and inspect in our inspection program, it gets to that neighborhood, and we inspect, they could again be told they've got to change the system based on our inspection ordinance. So I think that's where the fear comes in. Now, you're right, he does not have to change it under the ordinance, you know, but that's a situation between, you know, the buyer and seller. You made one false statement that somebody gave you some bad information about because you don't have to get an engineer and spend $3,000 to get a system engineered. There are installers that are licensed by the state of Rhode Island to do repairs and can design the system for a repair. Okay, so y the system cost is what it is. It's part of their uh, uh, package that they perform for you. And there's several in the area that are licensed to do, uh, by the state of Rhode Island, to do design for repairs. And what you have, where you have a cesspool and upgrading to a septic system would be considered a repair. New construction requires, or commercial, requires an engineer to engineer the system first. So that, that's one thing that, you know, a little bit off on your numbers. The fact that there's a year for this to be performed, that it can be done into a purchase and sales if that's the only thing stopping this property from selling, is to withhold an amount of money, and it's done in many cases of real estate, it's done in many cases, is to do an escrow uh, when it's determined when you get a, an, an estimate on what it would cost to do the system. So that shouldn't be a factor. In my particular case, it happened twice. I was well, willing to put $10,500 into an escrow account, and the other one was $15,000, and the buyer said, no, nope, they want it out of the deal. I, I, the but, m sir, the thing is, the ordinance cannot and will not address what happens between a buyer and seller of a property. It's the fact that Rhode Island DEM, although approved in 1950 or whatever time your house was built, you know, that a cesspool was a legal system, and since then, all of the information that's in, they have decided that those that cesspools are a, a larger pollutant than they want to see. That a septic system, uh, and it's been since about 1973, that a system <coughs> is required, you know, a septic system is required for a house rather than a cesspool. So it's been a long time coming in, in changing these things over. But this council is not in control of a, the sale and purchase and the negotiations in terms of price and what is and isn't on a piece of property. Uh, your property, by the terms of this ordinance, is exempt from the replacement of the system, so you don't have to do it. But many buyers are looking probably at the rest of the ordinance that we have in our wastewater ordinance, which is calling for inspections, and are we going to require somewhere down the line that these systems be upgraded. So if I'm going to purchase a house, I maybe don't want to go through this in four or five years from now, be in the same position. So I'd rather have it done before I buy the house. So, and that's just uh, someone's preference. But Putting a heavy burden on people that want to, uh, to sell their property. It's, I, sir, it's not a heavy burden on people who want to sell a property. It's making sure the property is brought up to whatever the standard is today for that property. Uh, you know, the, it, it may be a burden if somebody bought a house a year ago and is trying to sell it, you know, this year because they don't have enough equity in it. But for the amount of time you've owned the property and the equity in the property, it probably will more than support whatever it costs to upgrade a system. Okay. <laughs> it, it, well, no, the a heavy burden <laughs> on, on, on the residents that have been here all these years, and these systems, and matter of fact, this cesspool is working fine, but it's a cesspool. 
The, that ordinance says a, set, a septic system is all right if it's working properly. A cesspool is no good. I think every house on Campion Avenue, I don't know about the rest of the Tivoli, almost every house, for the exception of the new uh, section that was just built down there, has a cesspool. From, from all my neighbors, this is only good, this looks like it's only good for the contractors. And I spoke to two engineers, one was Chaplin and one was uh, uh, Smith. And both of them said they charged the engineer that between $1,600 and $2,000. It's not necessary to get an engineer is what I'm telling you for the situation you're the in. DEM, the DEM That's DEM right. And the license installer can do the design to be accepted by DEM for approval. They to, to do that too, providing they get the system. Well, I think um, uh, Mr. Bolin has given you sort of an ample uh, explanation of the issue before us. The public hearing we're holding tonight is solely on this one section, uh, plus the variance. So we thank you for your comments. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to be heard on this yeah. matter? <coughs> My name is Alexander Moreau. I live on Campion Avenue also. Uh, I'm at that age that uh, I can't take this much pressure from these people anymore, from Town of Tiverton. If anything has to be done, I don't know why these people haven't done anything already before this. I would like to sell my piece of property because it seems like every time I turn around, my taxes go up, 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 up. I happen to be a World War II veteran I lost a father and a brother in a war because of these people. I wouldn't say all of these people, but the people. And I go over here to town hall and I said, I'd like to have a fixed income on my property. I'd like my property to be level off to what it is right now. I started at 200 and some odd dollars a year, and now I'm hitting $3,000 a year. My wife's blind. I'm getting disabled for some reason or another. I don't know why, because I'm close to 80 years old, probably. And now I'm, 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 getting, I'm getting all this stuff about uh, cesspools and all that. I haven't had my cesspool pumped out in 40, 45 years. Nothing has been touched to it. And now if I have to, cess if I have to sell my property, I have to have a, an inspector come in? Come on now. Let's give us a break, will you? Thank you. Well, Okay. Anybody else from uh, Campion Avenue? Ken Dyer, 64 Campion Avenue. I've lived there two years and I would like to sell and uh, have a cesspool so now I can take it up, put in a, uh, I didn't get a chance to see the copy of the variance in the ordinance. Yep. So he was telling me I have to put in a septic system before I can sell my house now? <coughs> no, if your house is not, is not on the market, not right now, but I plan on putting it on the market. Basically been? states if the house sells and it has a cesspool, <coughs> it has to be upgraded within one year of the sale. That's what I mean. So uh, in order for me, to, I'd have to do it myself. Well, or or escrow it with uh, a buyer when you decide to uh, sell your house. Are you going to sell your house? Yes. Okay. Well, then that's, that is uh, something you're going to be faced with. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> okay. Can I ask one more question? I apologize. Yes. Now, what happens if I upgrade the system and I put it, well, I'm going to have to do that, put in a septic system, and in four years the sewer comes down and the new owner is forced to, and now has a brand new septic system? The, the, ordinance, the ordinance in another section says that if you have a system that's been put in recently that you can get a waiver for up to 10 years. But a septic system, if I have it put in right by... If you have a septic system put in years, and... the and for 30 years, and they're the, telling the, the new person if they can only use it for 10, then they have to... No, I'm not telling only for 10 years. I'm telling you that you have the right to go before the Wastewater Management Commission for a waiver to tie into the sewer because of that. And that waiver is available, as for, from what I understand, for a period up to 10 years. So I, I'm not sure what the waiver, how long they'll let you go before they make you tie in. But if it's a functioning system, you know, I, that's, that was all considered when we talked about this because anybody who puts one in should not be made because the ordinance says that even if you had a septic system, if, if, there was a, if everybody on Campion Avenue had a septic system and a line went down the street, yep. everybody would have one year to tie into that. 
by the ordinance. If, if the line becomes available, everybody must tie in within one year. Even if I just put in a 30? No, th no. If I you can, did that, you can, you can apply for a variance, but somebody who's got a system that's 15 years old yeah. that had, a th as you said, a 30-year lifespan would have to tie in because the ordinance requires it. So the if, only I, if I change my septic system this summer, yes, and then two years from now you come down and say, well, we're gonna, you got to put into it that we got a sewage now. We would like you to tie into it, and then I apply for a variance, a I waiver, could, a waiver. I could get 12 years out of my 30-year septic system, and then I have to pay to tie into the sewer. But it, everyone is in the same position, sir. If the line comes down a street, well, I somebody who's got a system who get disabled. So what? I would just I got to monitor my money here, so. Oh, I, I understand that, but I'll tell you what, I don't think you're going to see a sewer system on Campion Avenue within the next two years, or ten years, probably. I didn't think I'd uh, have to put in a septic system when I bought the house. Yeah. And, and, right, when you bought the house, you don't have to, and that's the point. The point of the matter is, they're considered by DEM and have been considered by DEM, by Rhode Island DEM, as a substandard system, okay? And that's, this ordinance is to try to correct that situation and bring it up. They are considered to pollute the ground. You people, you, f you have water there now. I, but I yeah. have pump yeah. system, not in the past year, not 40, yeah. but the past year. Yeah. Well, I understand that. One more thing that uh, uh, we have not mentioned, but there is a hardship provision that was drafted in this ordinance. And the Wastewater Management Commission <coughs> can grant a variance from the ordinance based upon hardship. So that's something to bear in mind as well. Now that, that a hardship to live in the house, but not to sell the house. But, and no, if you, uh, uh, but it says, the Wastewater Management Commission shall grant a variance based upon findings of fact that the application of, this is the septic system requirement, would amount to a severe hardship based upon the cost of the new septic system in relationship to the cost of the house or that the application of the septic system section would be manis manifestly unfair in the light of the circumstances of the sale of the house. So that is a safety valve for people who have a hardship. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Bennis, your name please. Roger Bennis, Narragansett Avenue. In relation to his uh, question, I have a similar <coughs> problem with respect to uh, the now 10 years added on to the life of a, let's say, 30-year septic system. Uh, is there a possibility of extending that beyond the 10 years? Because I find, uh, like a mortgage on a house, if you have a 30-year mortgage on a house and suddenly it's uh, turned into a 10-year mortgage, that's, that's a big thing. If you have spent upwards of $30,000 to put in a new septic system uh, and you're uh, half a mile or a mile away from a sewer and the sewer comes down the street, like you said, uh, two years or four years down the line, an extension of 10 years is great if you look at it with respect to no extension at all but it's horrible with respect to the potential life of 30 years. Is there any way of extending that you know, beyond I, I guess, that? I Roger, I think the problem with this becomes that when sewer lines become, when sewer lines become available, there's going to be all kind of people on every street who have systems of, of varying age. And if you start to say that this one here, because it's only 10, doesn't have to tie in this one here's 12, that's on a borderline, this one's 15. You've defeated the purpose of putting the sewer line to get the connection, because the whole idea of being able to afford to put the sewer line is you need the connections in order to pay for, for its cost. So to put a sewer line in and then say the only time you have to tie in is if your system fails, is, is kind of uh, uh, defeating the purpose of doing the system. Can I also say one thing? That issue is not subject to this public hearing. The only thing we have before us is this section 186505. The cesspools. On cesspools. 
The question of sewers, they're coming down. They're not going to be in Narragansett Avenue very soon, and you know that, Roger. But I, I think we have to stick to the subject. And the subject tonight is the cesspool requirement plus the variance. Those are the only two sections we have before us. Thank you. But it, it's still a valid point. Thank we, you. Uh, we've heard you and it's accepted. It'll be in the minutes. <laughs> Anybody else wish to be heard on this matter? Now, questions from the council, Mr. Costa? Yeah, I, I don't. I simply have a, a very small suggestion. Uh, on page three, uh, under the appeals and variances, yes. uh, 1867 is, is entitled Wastewater Management Commission. Uh, and I read that, and then I read 186702, which is entitled uh, Variances, and I thought I was reading the same thing again. So I, and then I went back to find out that the first paragraph appeal, uh, applies to appeals, and the second one to variances. I wonder if we could just either change the title to 186701 to appeals, or, or uh, in, in other words, there should be some uh, indication that one is appeals and the other is variances. It's a typographical thing. You get it? Okay. Now, just, just for the record, I, I think, it, well, when you're ready to, to the motion, but um, I think that would be the simplest way to do it. If you just change the subtitle of 18-67.01 to appeals, colon, then that would make it clear to people yeah. you know, what you were looking, which one you were looking at. Appeals, colon. Okay. Um, the one, seems to me, the one issue that we have is option X before us and... Um, a date certain. A date certain. Um, and uh, uh, so... Okay. Madam President, I'm opposed to option X and I'm opposed for this reason. We've heard testimony here tonight about people trying to sell a piece of property and the length of time it may take to sell a piece of property. In a soft market, it may take more than a year to sell that piece of property and to put a date certain um, would, I think, defeat the purpose of having entered into this and giving them the time frame uh, if the house was on the market by a certain date. While I'm, I'm in agreement with Mr. Bowen uh, concerning the soft market, I am definitely in favor of having a date certain. Even if we extend it to January 1st, 2009, I believe there should be a set date certain. Otherwise, this thing's just going to go on forever. Mm -hmm. The reason why I think a date, a date certain is important is that after property's been on the market, you change your agent, you lose your records. Um, I think that's another added reason. Uh, perhaps we should at least go from a year from this, um, you know, a year from this date or April 1st. But I do think there should be a date certain. I would even want to extend it to you know, July of 2008. July 1st, 2008. <coughs> Any further questions, comments from anybody? Um, I wouldn't, uh, I, I would like to see this thing. I'm, I'm going to make a motion to approve the the 186505 and not do the option X and, and let's see if we can get through one and then okay. argue the second point because I, I wouldn't want to vote against that section over the issue of the, the, okay, so the date motion for certain is, and have it, yeah. It's limited solely to uh, 1605 without the last sentence. We'll do this in two votes. Yes. Okay. And it will also include 18670 appeal and variances. Yes. Well, I think that's already. Yeah, we're just yep. we'll yeah, okay. into that okay. to change. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, all those in favor of that motion? I'll second that. Okay. And that's the language for 186701 as amended by Mr. Costa, is that correct? Yes. Yes. And the only thing that we're not voting on is the option, option X. X. At this moment? Yes. Okay, all those in favor of that motion, raise your right hand. Okay. Now let's move to option X. Who would like to make a motion? I, I would make a motion that we adopt 
option in Texas part of this ordinance and place a date certain of January 1st, 2009 to allow for any softness in the current real estate market. I'll second this. Okay, all those, any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed? Four, two, one, opposed. Okay, Mr. Carroll, you can come back here. That closes the public hearing, and now I'll move to the public hearing in connection with the amended noise ordinance. And Mr. Ramatowski, state your name. Good evening, uh, Tom Ramatowski, Chairman of the Conservation Commission. I'd like to speak in favor of the revisions. Hold on to just this. a second. Um, I just want to I have a little background noise subdued okay. here, but I don't have my gavel. Excuse me. Uh, uh, we need to be quiet. Okay. This gentleman now has the floor. Thank you. Again, I'd like to speak in favor of the proposed amendments to the noise ordinance. They did originate from our commission. Uh, just a very brief summary of what they entail. Uh, noise is a form of pollution. It's uh, well recognized now that it can have harmful effects on people and their well-being. Uh, we've always had a noise ordinance since at least 1967, maybe even before that, so this is not something that's brand new. It's uh, more updates to something that was already in existence to clarify certain areas and, and we think make it work a little better. And uh, finally, uh, there's been a lot of concern that this may prohibit such and such an activity like the band marching or things of that sort. There is a section in it that allows people to apply for variances or permits or, or wording like that for things that may in fact be uh, outside of the scope of what's allowed uh, by right. And I think that's a good system to have because in that case, if someone's going to be doing something that involves noise or is loud, they can come to this town council, apply for the variance, have it all out in public. Uh, the neighbors will know, everybody will know, and it should allow those types of issues to be adjudicated in a, in a fair and uh, open manner for everybody. Uh, with that being said, I know everybody's looked at this. We've had the workshops, et cetera. We do have the people from our commission that were responsible in writing this, and they are much more knowledgeable than I am. Uh, so if there are specific questions that come up, uh, they'll be happy to address them uh, for you before the public. Thank you. Uh, I will, is there anybody else? Mr. Cody, I see your hand up. Is this open to the public? It is. We have opened the public hearing. My name's Alan Cody from 67 Wampanoag Lane. I have neighbors next to me that have a retarded boy. He's in his late 40s, early 50s. And that boy, during the summer, likes to put on a record or a tape and sing. I thank God that my children, when they were born, were fine. This boy didn't choose to come into the world this way. There is grumbling down there about his singing. And all I can say is with an ordinance like this, in the summertime, when that boy's out in the porch, playing his record and singing his song, that we're gonna have the police department down there time and time again. That's all I can tell you about it. He doesn't bother me one bit. Well, you know, th there's not a change in the ordinance from that. Th this or that language has always, already been in the existing ordinance, and the police have not been down there. Okay. Okay. Um, Sally Black, 64 Broadview Drive. I've been asked to come to address the new athletic complex at the high school, and it's already been talked by Ms. Sullivan and Mr. Ramatowski. But when we have the uh, outdoor games at night with the band and the everything else and I'll tell you when I hear that on Friday night from my house when they're in Portsmouth I say thank God that these children these teenagers are safe and supervised and surrounded by their families so I hope we don't have a problem with that in the neighborhood thank you you know there is an exemption for public assembly activities I guess you are aware of that and again 
We haven't had an issue of that type in the past. I don't expect. This is this is a statue that's used when you need it. Yeah. Yeah. But if Peter Rabbit got out there with the band <laughs> at 2 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> we might have a problem and it calls to the police. He's very quiet, Peter Rabbit. <laughs> that was the best publicity that craft fair ever got. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there anybody else who wishes? Mr. Bennis. <coughs> Roger Bennis, Narragansett Avenue. I have several comments. I would have uh, typed them up, but I was unable to get a copy from the website because it was not available on the website. It would have made things a lot easier if I could have copied and pasted it and uh, put comments next to it to pass out. Uh, first comment is essentially on page three, halfway down the page on sound level. <coughs> So sound level means the weighted sound pressure level obtained by the use of a sound level meter and frequency weighting network. That's totally inadequate. It should be by the use of a calibrated, sealed, and dated, open parentheses, by an accredited agency using NBS standards, close parentheses. Any measurement made using an instrument that isn't calibrated, and sealed and tied to the National Bureau of Standards is totally inadequate and unacceptable. As a certified quality auditor, I'll tell you that. Any audit that I've ever done, I've knocked down anything that isn't tied to the National Bureau of Standards. Uh, next item on page 4 of 13, section 38104. If the measurements are made with A, and then I would like to add calibrated, comma, sealed, comma, and dated to the sound level meter. Uh, paragraph, uh, or section 38-105, exceptions to the ordinance. Uh, I would like to add section I as an exception to the ordinance, stating the barking of a dog that is provoked by a sound and or actions originating from outside. You gotta slow down, Roger. I, I flunked my shorthand, please. <laughs> the barking of a dog that is provoked by sound or actions originating from outside the dog owner or caretaker's property. In other words, if somebody is provoking that dog into barking, I don't think that the uh, dog owner should be paying the fine because somebody's provoking it, either with an air horn, by screaming, shut up at the dog, and expecting the dog to actually shut up instead of bark continuously. Well, the police can come and, and get the person. I, I, yeah. I, I, I say that from yeah. personal experience. <laughs> also, uh, Right after that, J, I would like to add the emission of sound associated with the practice of unamplified musical instruments that occurs on private property and or in a non-entertainment setting and or on school property between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. The way this ordinance is written right now, any student practicing a musical instrument is subject to fine. That's ridiculous. But somebody firing a firearm isn't, because that's one of the exceptions that's already in there. I think that's kind of ridiculous, where you're going to allow people to fire off firearms. That's another change I would propose. In D, 
it should be, it is now saying the emission of sound and the discharge of weapons between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. I believe it should say the emission of sound in the legal discharge of weapons at a licensed facility between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. I think if somebody's discharging weapons in their basement, that it's not proper to tell the police that they can't issue a, uh, a noise ordinance fine to that person, because the way it reads now, they can't. Well, I think another ordinance takes care of that, discharging an, a firearm within 500 feet. But they wouldn't be able to give him a fine for I think violating the, severity, the noise ordinance. I think the severity of the other one would step in on that, Roger. <laughs> But it makes it ridiculous where you're allowing people to fire off firearms on their property illegally Keep going without out. a fine, but they can't play a musical instrument. On page 6 of 13, section 38-122, item C, the last line where it says, in a newspaper of general circulation in town. I couldn't find the advertisement for this hearing. I only saw it as, a, uh, as an item on tonight's agenda. I think uh, we should put a comma after the word town and put on the, and on the town website. Page seven. Uh, that's part of section 38-123, item C2. Referring to uh, dogs and other animals. It says, each day of the noise disturbance shall constitute a separate violation of this section. I believe it should state, each day of the noise disturbance after the legal receipt of a notice of the previous violation shall constitute a separate violation of this section. I don't believe it's kosher to hit somebody with four violations at once if you haven't got the notice that he got the proof that he received the first one. And I'm not looking at this just for my own protection. I'm looking at it I believe what's good for one person is good for everybody. On page 8 of 13. On um, 1, 2, 3, the third line down, must a noise level must exceed the ambient noise level by 5 dBA. I believe that should be 6 dBA. 6 dBA is one octave. 5 dBA is less than one octave. People can't, a lot of people can't even hear the difference of 5 dBA. In terms of noise measurements, one octave is usually considered a noticeable difference. And it, uh, it goes on, when measured at the nearest property line, I believe that since there are areas in town with very close property lines and very close buildings in the north end of town and areas closer to the town hall where the street was put too close to a house. And I say that because the town put their two streets too close to my house. My house was there 200 years ago and the streets are only 100 years old. So the house wasn't put too close to the street, it's the other way around. So I believe that should be when measured at a point 25 feet from the nearest property line. It's a more sensible reading. So you're not standing at the property line and looking in somebody's uh, window, like at the north end of town. Page 9, section 38, 135, measurement of sound. There should be an item 13. 
When the noise occurs in spikes or in RMS, and the spike duration and or the RMS period. There's, in the measurement of sound, there's two types of sound. There's RMS sound, which means root mean square sound, which is an average value. You also have to take into account spikes in sound, like the firing of a gun is results in a totally erroneous reading if you're taking an RMS reading. Item uh, 38135B, where it says uh, table one below or exceeds the ambient noise level by more than three decibels. I believe that should be six decibels which is a, uh, a sound that somebody can hear rather than three decibels that can't even be heard. The next item, a couple lines down, two measurements of noise, where it says maintained in calibration, it should say maintained in calibration, comma, sealed and dated, comma. <laughs> What, one, two, three, four, five lines down. Measurements recorded shall be taken so as to provide. I believe that's a reversal of wording. It should be measurements taken shall be recorded and not measurements recorded shall be taken. That's kind of a flip-flop in English. Must be a dyslexic thinker. <laughs> <laughs> item B below that. I'm oh, sorry, item C. The measurement shall be made at the property line, I believe should say, shall be made at a point 25 feet from the property line. <laughs> And within item B, just above it, it sh should have a statement indicating when the noise occurs in short duration spikes of less than one second, spike noise measurements shall be taken. That's in relation to the noise measurement status that I was speaking of in terms of the firing of a gun. If you take an RMS reading, it makes no sense at all. You need a spike reading. And the meter also needs to be capable of reading spikes. On page 10, section 38137, no person shall operate or permit the intentional sounding outdoors of any fire, burglar, or civil defense alarm, comma, siren, comma, please add air horn, comma, fog horn, comma. to that statement. Section 38.141, musical instruments and similar devices. This whole paragraph makes it illegal to practice a musical instrument. I think the whole paragraph should be deleted. Or at the least, there should be a statement in there if it is left in, so it says, no person shall operate, play, or permit the operation or playing of any drum, musical instrument, or similar device, comma, for commercial and or entertainment purposes, comma, which produces sound, etc. So it distinguishes between uh, a band blasting music out of a window of a commercial establishment to entertain some people and annoy the neighbors as opposed to somebody who's practicing a musical instrument because they're in the high school band. In uh, 38.143 on page 11, item A, uh, 
two lines from the bottom of item A, this section shall not apply to delivery or pickup vehicles that require the operation of the engine to unload or load their vending loads. I believe this should be changed to this section shall not apply to delivery or pickup vehicles that require engine power to unload or load their vending <coughs> loads. I have had numerous instances where I've asked somebody to turn off their engine when it shouldn't be polluting everybody around it and I've heard the excuse, oh, it won't restart. They use that we same excuse at gas stations to illegally run their engines and risk uh, blowing up the entire station. Of course, it's only a million to one shot that it would blow up the entire station. But people spend a lot of money on the lottery on ads that are much, diff much like that. Page 12, item C, uh, calibration should have added comma, sealed and dated, and in good working order. Page 13, last page, finally. I heard you say that. Did you? Well, you thought it anyway. Uh, 38, pardon? I said I have no comment. Huh? <laughs> oh, it was you that was thinking that. I knew one of you was. I couldn't hear you. The decibel was too low. Keep going. Section 38145. I believe A should be deleted, where it says no person shall operate or permit the sounding of any stationary bell, chime, siren, whistle, or similar device intended primarily for non-emergency use from any place for more than one minute in any one hour. That, that's kind of telling people that, oh, it's okay to sound any kind of loud, horrible device. Just don't do it more than one minute an hour. That's ridiculous. By deleting that, you allow somebody to be to be fined for doing that one minute every hour. You shouldn't give them the permission to do that. Item B, where it says uh, devices in conjunction with places of religious worship should be exempt from this operation section. I believe it should state when a proper exception is obtained after that. Otherwise, any church, and there are many places now that you and I would not consider a place of worship that others do for various reasons, they call themselves a religious organization, will have all kinds of noise emanating from them. Any standard religious organization should be applying for a permit, and the permit should just be a quick thing for a church that has a bell that tolls on the hour. <coughs> and that would, al would allow some control over every Tom, Dick, and Harry that decides as a religious organization they're going to be blasting from some uh, high-powered uh, loudspeakers. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Is there anybody else who uh, wishes to be heard on the ordinance? Yes. Yeah, Madam President, um, there is one thing that um, I, I noticed in the comments that I'd like to suggest as an amendment. Um, it came in the, the rewriting of this as a wrong cross-reference. And on page 5 of 13, and I appreciate people who may have raised this at the beginning, Page 5 of 13, uh, subsection C up at the very top, which is the exemptions, which yes. as you were saying, non-commercial public speaking and public assembly, except those activities can be controlled by section 13141, regulation of sound equipment and sound amplifying equipment. Um, and in fact, that should be 38142. 
um, which is in fact the section which is regulating the amplification. Um, but 38141 is just what we were talking about, the musical instruments. And if the musical instruments are in fact um, done in connection with the public assembly and the non-commercial, then they're okay, then they are exempt. So it's just when the numbers got moved, that cross-reference got missed. So it should be 38142 in that subsection C on page five. Okay. Okay. Um, that, that's that is your that that's my thing. I, I'm available for any other questions. I know members of the this was not drafted by me, but I did work with the conservation commission, and I, as I said, I'm a, if you want to ask any questions, okay. council. Madam President. Yes. Um, under the um, I guess it's page eight of thirteen under C, which is. I, I do believe that we need to take a look somewhere along the line on the res the nuisance alarm violations. I think the the penalties are uh, too low for a response that may be required for our police officer and putting either a police officer in danger or our firefighters in danger because someone is not properly maintaining their alarm system. Um, and I think some consideration should be given to looking at that. Um, it costs us a lot of money to respond to vehicle and one accident because someone trying to get to uh, a poorly maintained alarm even at the third time could cause some serious consequence. Can, in all fairness, how often does that actually happen? I, we, I've not had, I don't know, and, you know we haven't put a, a number on that. I mean, I, I think when, when we're looking at something like this, I think you have to look at the statistics that go along with it. You know, and if, if you're saying, you know, if there's, if there's cases where it's going on and on and on, and if, if you, you're passing things like that as a deterrent, that's fine. But, but you know, if, if there's something that's habitual that's going on all the time, that's fine. But if it's, if it's not... It, it may not be now, but it could happen a, a year from now. And wouldn't it be better to have it in place, the penalties? I, I would be more inclined to, if we have a nuisance becomes apparent, to address it at that juncture as opposed to putting something into this ordinance now that I think would be uh, very burdensome to some people. Yeah, I, th I think we've made we've made several places install alarms, you know, that are relatively new to them. The sensitivity of those alarms probably are in question, and I think until we get a better handle on what's happening with, especially you know, in terms of the fire alarms, we made just about every business put an audible alarm tied to the fire department, so forth and so on, and. Uh, uh, you know, and I think we required them to buy certain equipment because it was a proprietary system that could only, you know, so we may end up with some questions on that and rather than find people for something that they didn't have a control over what they purchased, you know, we may have to work at that in a different fashion. So I have to agree with, with Mr. Edwards in this case and say kind of like, let's leave the penalties where they are and see if we got a problem with the penalties and if it does become cumbersome or burdensome to the town. And then we react in, in that fashion. Let's see how the system works. I have no problem with that. <coughs> may I say? <coughs> may I? Yes. Uh, may I say this? I recall when this topic arose not too many years ago, uh, I think the fire chief indicated that false alarms uh, happen rather frequently. So take that for what it's worth. But while we're on that page. <coughs> Our chief is here while we inquire. Let's find out, and the, and the and the police chiefs here too. Let's find out. Our deputy chief is here. Let's find out how many. Let's get a statistic. How many false alarms are we getting lately? I don't believe it's a widespread problem. I'd have to look at our statistics, but I don't think it's it's a major problem to date. Okay, how about from the fire department's point of view? Again, I'd have to agree with the deputy. It's not a major <coughs> problem on our end. What we end up is. Some residential home alarms sometimes when they're through an outside vendor uh, does make it difficult to silence them if someone doesn't have the key code or the key to it, but they're not an overwhelming problem from our end. Okay. Thank okay. you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, while we're on page um, 8 of 13, 
Uh, paragraph D uh, it, uh, pr provides that the police and chief shall have the option of issuing an order disconnecting the audible portion of the alarm system in the event of these false alarms. And I would ask our, our town solicitor, does that put the town in any kind of uh, position of liability uh, if the chief should silence it and something happens? Uh, the would, may I pardon? I think that's two separate portions. One is the neighbors ain't going to hear it, but the alarm code still rings into the station. They're a, they're a two-part system. Am I correct in that, Chiefs? That the systems are a two-part system. There's the audible alarm, and then the alarm rings into your stations on most of these? Or? You're correct. Even though the audible, a lot of people have house alarms, the audible won't go off, but still, the company will call into the station okay. or respond. But in North Tiverton, where houses are close to each other, we would be eliminating notice to houses immediately adjacent to the one that's having a problem. And if they don't get notice and they suffer a loss of some sort or an injury of some sort, I just wonder if the town would be, uh, would be held liable. Let me ask you this. Have you ever had occasion to come up where you've suggested that the audible portion be disconnected? Not to my recollection. I, I don't recall ever dealing with that. Okay. Most of them uh, reset. Not that I'm aware of in this community. I have had it in previous community. You can't go for more than 15 off, minutes by silence. They reset. Most, okay. most, of, most of them reset after five minutes anyways. They'll, they'll reset themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks, is the council ready for a motion on this? I no. no. Well, I do, too. I want, but I'll yield to... Uh, no, I'll Mr. let you go Boston first. I, my list, I have a list like Mr. Bennis had. <laughs> and I'm not going to go through the whole list because on some of them we agree. Uh, well, go ahead, uh, Paul. You sure? Yeah. I, I'm going back to the kids with the music part of it. Um, in, in, I, I know um, Sally spoke about the, the football games that hopefully will we'll get the kids going at night, and I know that that's a public assembly, but when the kids are marching around during the daytime or with band practice, that is not a public assembly. And this ordinance, I, I went through this ordinance over the weekend, and I don't see anything in here that would that says that that they that it's uh, an accepted practice. So if the band director should decide during the summertime when when he's practicing with these kids for two weeks in August, like he normally does, or on a on a nice day after school when he's having an afternoon practice, and and he goes around with them, I don't see anything in there where there's an exception to Propose it. I don't. Something then, I just I, I just don't know. I don't see anything there. I I. I I don't see anything in there that, that would accept that. Well, then propose something. Um, I'm not an attorney. Throw something. Put some language there. <coughs> how, how about if we added to the exception? I yeah, I would, I would rather have it from the attorney with all due respect. <laughs> um, how about the... better job with it. I'm <laughs> no. um, Maybe on the decibels, yes. Let's uh, cut out the... Uh, yeah, um, I think uh, I would say in um, section 38106, um, 106, I'm sorry, 38105, um, subsection C, which is the basic exemption, non-commercial public speaking and public assembly activities, I think I would add non-commercial public speaking um, public education and public assembly activities. Okay. Very good. And that would kind of take care <coughs> on a broad category, but public education, the school stuff. Fantastic. <coughs> now, I mean, you know, you may still have complaint. I mean, there may be people that complain, you know, I got the band, I got all these people who can't play at all, playing the band for hour after hour right outside my door. No. But that would be the exemption. This if does you not want. relieve people of the ability to complain. No. No, it doesn't. No. <laughs> no. And also... Uh, Rightly or wrongly. Yeah. No, it doesn't. So... Um, but, but I would limit it to that. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give any, a general exemption to the no. music because, no. uh, I mean, someone who's a band, uh, you know, someone's band that's practicing yep. can be just as loud and that's disturbing correct. as some band that's actually playing for money in an establishment. That's correct. But this would take care of the public education aspect of it. I'm sorry, Mr. Tights, would you repeat that once more for me? Um, on subsection C, it would say non-commercial public speaking, comma, public education, comma, 
and public assembly activities, et cetera. Thank you. If you are, I am. I, I, uh, I won't go through it uh, quite uh, as, as thoroughly as I had planned on going through it because it takes an awful long time. Uh, but let me begin by making a couple of statements, and that is that I am certainly all for a noise ordinance. There's no question about that. Uh, however, I think we've got an ordinance here which will not get much enforcement, simply because of the technicalities or the difficulty with which uh, uh, it has to be administered. Uh, the use of all that equipment that needs to be calibrated and sealed and, and uh, some policemen will be trained for it, some will not be trained for it, those that will be trained for it would not be available when you want them. Uh, I see that kind of problem with an ordinance that is as technical and as comprehensive as this one is. It will, it will probably uh, not be enforced the way we would like to see it enforced. Okay, getting down to a few specifics. Uh, <clears throat> On page 3 of 13, uh, one of the definitions provides, you know, yeah, I, okay, one of the definitions provides that variances uh, uh, are awarded after the application is approved by both the town council and the chief of police. Uh, I don't understand the town council um, sharing its powers to grant variances with the chief of police, at least not in this case. Uh, for example, what if the chief of police does not approve and the council does, or vice versa? What happens if the police chief does not approve or does approve? You, you understand the point I'm trying to make. I think the reference in that sound variance definition, we should strike the words both and the words and the chief of police. Um, I, I think that in order, in order to have that thing be as effective as possible, it should be reviewed and approved by the town council in consultation with the chief of police. That's okay with me. And I think that that's what we've done in the past where there's issues with the police department. We've at least consulted with them to get an opinion from the police department as to why we should or shouldn't uh, issue a variance. And th because they're the ones I think that truly need to be involved in. Sounds good. On page, on page five. <clears throat> Uh, down under section 38121, uh, uh, section B says, the police department assisted by any duly assigned town agency shall have the powers to, and it lists the powers of duly designated town agencies. I have no problem with anybody conducting research, monitoring, uh, conducting research, monitoring, and other studies related to sound. I have no problem with that, nor do I with number two. But with number three and number four, are they picking up whoever that agency might be, police powers, and, and is that proper? Um, uh, coordinating noise control activities for all town departments, uh, reviewing public and private projects for compliance with the ordinance, if projects are likely to cause sound in violation of this ordinance. Well, we have a planning board that does that, does that type of thing. Uh, I just don't see a place for that in the noise ordinance. It just makes it that much more complicated and will result in its lack of enforcement, I believe. Um, um, there's a provision in here that talks about continuing violations, but I couldn't find anything in the definitions which defined a continuing violation. You know, is that perpetual or every other day? Or what does it mean? I, I couldn't really tell. Um, the requirements for public hearings, public hearings for variances. I think the words, if required, should be inserted in this ordinance wherever the requirement for a public hearing is. Uh, we'll be getting some rather simple requests for variances, and if we have to go through the advertising and the publication and, and the public hearings, uh, they will certainly get, they'll be on the agenda, that's for sure, and I, I think that's sufficient. I think we're putting too much, too much emphasis on some of these things, which will, as I say, result in an inability to enforce, maybe, or at least a lack of enforcement. Uh, I don't think the police department has the time to concentrate on the requirements of this ordinance uh, in addition to its other uh, duties and responsibilities. We've got a good department, and I, I think they do a good job, but this is going to be difficult the, to enforce. The variance provision, is there any changes to the variance position from the current? I think there was uh, the issue of a variance to, for the noise ordinance, I believe, is in 
the current noise ordinance. Well, if it's in the current ordinance, it shouldn't be, in my opinion. <coughs> Let's see. Uh, well, we've, we've had uh, we've had issues of variances being requested by the council when it came to uh, down on the beach. When it came to you know different uh, people we've wanted to have music. Very few. Yeah, but we've had we, we have had requests though. But yes. I mean the provision of the it ordinance. Gives the neighbors a chance or the surrounding property owners. Yeah. Yeah. One of the people who was able to violate this charter is a crying child. Uh, I noticed when I read uh, scale uh, chart one or chart two that there were five decibel differences between, I think, a lawnmower and a chainsaw, and then there's 15 decibel difference between a chainsaw and a, and a crying child, and then above the crying child, it goes back to maybe 10 decibel variants from the crying child to, uh, I forget what it is. And I may not be taking it with the right topics, but if you look at the differences in decibel levels for different activities, I just wonder uh, that the source of that material, uh, I wonder how credible it is. Also, the final blow in this ordinance is that any noise above 70 decibels, which, uh, let's see. Seventy decibels is any noise which is louder than a vacuum cleaner uh, is going to be a violation. This this is difficult. Uh, the ordinance needs to be uh, looked at. They need to insert the reasonable man standard as most laws provide. It's not at the source. Yeah. You're talking about these are levels registered at the property line. Yeah. Where the measurement would take place. Okay. So it's not, it's not that you're not going to hear. I have, I have a grandchild. I would love to hear you people <laughs> hear him scream. <laughs> that kid's going to be in. That's the property line, right? <laughs> wherever. From my he's going to be in jail line. before he's five years old. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's <laughs> tough. Yeah. It, this is a difficult, uh, I shouldn't say difficult, but it's, it's just a tough ordinance. And because of that toughness and the lack of, some of the point you made before, Madam President, about, uh, I wouldn't call it an escape clause, but a reasonable man type of, of, of clause in well, there you know, is required. Policemen uh, always are com uh, confronted with the reasonableness of, uh, uh, of prosecuting. And um, so an ordinance like this is really an ordinance when you need it. If there is an assistant noise, somebody's turned up their stereos in the yard and it's heard around the neighborhood, that's when the police can move. But I don't think they're going to go over your, is it grandson? Uh, actually, it's a granddaughter, but I didn't want to insult them. I'm a little nervous because we are on public TV and I think <laughs> Uh, maybe I'm making too much noise, but uh, maybe I'm going to go to jail. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to vote against the adoption of the ordinance as it's written, but I think it should be reworked. That's my position. Okay. Uh, all right. Do we have a motion? One way for the other. I have Assessment. some comments. I mean, we're going to accept uh, Mr. Bennis's comments here because I have some uh, comments no. on some of those. No, uh, I think uh, we have to make that decision, but um, uh, um, that I think the town solicitor has made one uh, correction, including public education. Um, having uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Mr. Coster has made some comments about the police department. Um, as to whether even B should be included. As to whether that is appropriate. You can consider that. Um, but I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I was just concerned that, uh, I mean, as, as it's written, a, a lot of the stuff I believe was correct. I mean, I don't want to expect the police 
I don't expect to see the police out there trying to measure something 25 feet from the property line. But we should establish a point, the property line's it. Right. Um, and also, there are some other areas where you wanted to, to um, increase the decibel level from like three to six with octave changes and stuff. I mean, it's, as it's written, five or three uh, decibels, I think, is something that's registrable on a working decibel meter. Um, and the issue with the uh, foghorn, trying to add in foghorn. I mean, the Coast Guard regulates foghorns. So I wouldn't want to be out there trying to pursue them. Okay. Um, Ma Madam Chair? Here. Yes. Solicitor? Yeah, I mean, if you, uh, if you want, I, I do, I think there are a couple of the uh, suggestions, I don't know if you know, I guess it would be the time. I do think, uh, there were a couple of the suggestions that I would recommend incorporating. Calibrated and dated? Although calibrated no, is something that is in the ordinance right. as it is. Right. Um, let me just kind of say as a as an introduction, I, I understand Mr. Costa's concerns about this is very technical. Um, but the problem is if you do have a problem and you want to and you do need to enforce it, it has to be technical. The old standard of, oh, it's annoying and disturbing cannot be enforced. That is too subjective. You have to have the objective standards. Um, the police department does have a meter. Um, they do need to have people trained on it regularly, it's, so that's going to have to be done to have people trained. I actually have been trained on a noise meter myself, but more than a couple of years ago, so I probably should be retrained too. Um, I don't really think we need the certified, calibrated, sealed, dated stuff everywhere. I think that's uh, we have it one place about the calibration, and I think that's a, it's inherent in the calibration about the the, rem the remainder. When you calibrate it, you're going to be sealing it. You're going to be putting with the date that it's done in a log. Um, there were a couple of things, though, that I did um, want to suggest incorporating from those comments. Um, the, oh, the other thing I just wanted to say about the the three and the six decibels and so forth, and I would defer to the Conservation Commission. That's that's their policy issue, just as the number and limits are here are yours. But to remember that this is a logarithmic scale. It's not a regular scale um, so that basically the, the quietest thing you could hear in all silence is about zero decibels. And if you have um, a sound ten times more powerful than that silence, is going to be 10 uh, dBA. A sound 100 times more powerful is going to be 20 dBA. And 1,000 times is going to be 30. And by the time you get up to 40, you're already at 100,000 times more powerful than the silence. So it increases very dramatically. Where um, do you place the granddaughter? <laughs> well, no. What was that comment about 1,000? <laughs> I, I, think, I think they have it here. They have a screaming child is at 105 decibels, and that is true. Screaming children can be very loud, and, um, oh. you know, uh, and, and I think that's something you have to realize. It also depends on the duration and so forth. Um, you know, I, I don't think anyone is saying that they're not, and again, it's the same thing. A screaming child inside your house is different from a screaming child right at your property line. Um, and I think the whole point, as you said, I mean, the police aren't going to go around. We're not Newport. So at least, uh, no, in Newport, there are two guys who work all summer from 4 in the afternoon till 2 in the morning driving around because they have a problem. They have a real problem with the noises in the party houses and the bars, and that's their job. They drive around with the new noise meter checking all the bars and the restaurants and so forth and when they get the complaints. I don't see that happening in Tiverton. In Tiverton, it's going to be where there's a complaint. And I think the police will use their discretion. I don't think we're going to be seeing crying children cited for noise violations. Except um, in Hannibal's house. No, I, I'm going to take the attorney's uh, opinion on that matter. Okay, but um, but your suggestion is that you would like to incorporate a couple of things. Yes, and, and let me get to that then. Um, uh, I would like to <coughs> incorporate... Um, on page 7 of 13, the statement uh, down at the bottom about each day of the noise disturbance shall constitute a separate violation. And I would put, not quite the exact words, but I would put each day of the noise disturbance after receipt 
of notice of the of the after receipt of the first notice of violation is a separate violation. I, I don't think one should you know be able to just wait and suddenly hit someone with multiple violations. On the other hand, once someone's on notice, I don't think you have to notify them each time to get it to be a new problem. So I would add each day of the noise disturbance, I would add after receipt of the first notice of violation shall constitute a separate violation of this section. And under um, section 38-135 on page 9 of 13, um, there was a suggestion to add a section 13 dealing with the spike duration. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't get all of the exact words, and I'm not sure about the RMS period, um, but um, I, I would add, and, and you may want to tinker with this, but the number 13, whether the noise is constant or in short duration or spikes. Which would deal with that, because I do think that's something that should be considered. Um, on the same page down under sub two, measurement of noise, I think he's right about the, uh, the, the flip-flop of recorded and taken. Should be measurements taken, shall be recorded so as to provide a proper representation. Actually, actually, I think the problem is the word recorded. I think it should be just, the word, the word recorded should be struck out. So it should say measurements shall be taken so as to provide a proper representation of the noise source. I think that would be the cleanest way to collect, correct that. Um, and likewise in sub B, this is similar to the one up above that um, spike measurements shall be taken for short duration noises. Right after sub B currently says the slow meter response of the noise level meter should be used in order to best determine that the average amplitude, but I think it should also say spike measurements should be taken for short duration noises. And I think those were all the ones that I was in favor of. Okay. Um, yes. Um, I just want to say I, I share some of some of Hannibal's concerns with the fact that we need, we need a noise ordinance. We need to revise this. I'm just concerned that we not create more problems by doing it. I'm pretty comfortable that we've hammered out a lot of the the compromises and the and put some safeguards in it. The main thing that maybe somebody can address and I think maybe people in the audience are also thinking this is what primarily is going to change between what we currently have and this because there are some of the issues we were talking about like the screaming child I think is an issue now I don't think this necessarily changes that but what is the primary issue what is the primary change that we're going to get by adopting this versus where we are today I think the town solicitor has touched upon one one is the technical is it the specific numbers is, is the primary um, we're not opening categories of things, it's simply just the measurement? Um, I think a couple of areas, and again, I, I guess I you know, I call upon conservation members to correct me or amplify it. Um, most of it is, is trying to fix the language and clarify it. For example, um, we're now going to basically try to regulate the sound on the waterways adjacent to the town. Right now, it's not technically, if someone's you know, out there with a very loud noise on the water, we don't cover it. So we're going to cover that now by the neighboring zone, just because we don't zone that. The other major change would probably be some of the exact numbers within the table had changed. And let me, because this was totally rewritten, we didn't have a red line version at this stage. But let me just compare for you right now residential open space 7 to 10 a.m. is at 60 
this would actually, uh, I'm sorry, is at 65. The new ordinance would lower it to 60. Residential open space 10 to 7, 10 at night to 7 in the morning is at 55. This would keep it at 55. General highway and commercial is at 75. This would lower it to 70. Light and general industrial is at 75. This would lower it to 70. And the, the waterway, as I said, we've changed the language a bit. It would also lower it from 75 to 70. So there, that is the major substantive change of the ordinance. Right. I guess that's what I'm getting at. This is not, we're not creating an entirely new category of no. things necessarily. We're just adjusting the numbers. The, the rest of the stuff is, is there as it is now. And um, th that's really what I see, the substantive change, changing those numbers, which are lowering them in those categories. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. Now, uh, I think maybe we should just summarize uh, the uh, uh, changes that I hopefully we can agree on. Just one quick question, sure. please, before. I, I know we're talking about the noise on the waterways. Just out of curiosity's sake, how are we looking to monitor the noise on the waterways with a with a meter? And and that's the you know, seeing that the boats are supposed to have muffle, uh, the engines on the boats are supposed to have mufflers to begin with. So I'm like, how are we looking to monitor the noise with the decibel meters on the, on the waterways? It, it would be monitored from the shore. It would be monitored from from the shoreline. The closest point on shore. Right, well, where we're able to be. I mean, uh, you know, I, it's the sort of thing, one boat going by every now and then is not going to do it. If it becomes a problem, that's when we'll have the complaints, and that's when the police would be there and, and, and deal with it to set up to... The boat's to tied up. Uh, uh, there's oftentimes an area of concern in this area. Can I just kind of go over and people can either mm -hmm. see what changes we yep. have made? Okay. Have you got a, my page number, Louise? Yes, I'm going <coughs> to, and I, I have missed one, but uh, let me just go over these. Under sound variance, um, the suggestion of Mr. Bo uh, Bolin was, and you, Mr. Uh, Costa, very, this is under sound variance, the last sentence reads, variances are awarded after the proper application is filed and has been reviewed and approved by the town council in consultation with the police chief. Okay, one change. <coughs> Next is on page five, uh, where we say under, it's uh, 38105C, non-commercial public speaking, public education, and public assembly activities. That is one. Now we didn't agree on this, but I, and we ha might have to renumber, but I think that, um, under B, three and four should be deleted, as I don't really see the. But excuse me, where are you? Before before you leave C above, we're going to just correct the cross reference there. Thirty-eight to thirty-eight one forty-two. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. <coughs> I think we should uh, take out three and four under B. Okay. Now, um, I think the next change is on page seven. <coughs> Under B, Mr. Tights? Yes. Um, no, at the bottom of the page. C2. It's, it's C2. Yes. The, the sentence at the bottom, each day of the noise disturbance, we would add the words, after receipt of the first notice of violation, okay. after the word disturbance. Okay. We didn't make any change in the third and fourth alarms. Moving on. And next is nine of the, nine, page nine under measurement of sound. 
we added, at the suggestion of the solicitor, uh, a, a 13, which would say whether the noise is constant or of short duration or spikes. Okay, next is under two measurement of noise under A. In the middle of that page, measurements taken. So we, we would just delete the word recorded. Yes, shall be taken so as to provide. Just take the word recorded out. <coughs> okay, and we had another one at the bottom of that. Um, sub B, B add yes. the, the sentence, spike measurements shall be taken for short duration noises. Add it at the end. You add it. Right. Okay. Then, okay, what did I miss? Yeah, well, I don't like it. I think that was everything. Okay. So, counsel, with those changes, do you think we can take a vote one way? I would make a motion that we adopt the noise ordinance as a, has changed. I'll second that motion, Madam Chairman, and I've changed my mind about voting against the adoption. I will now vote for the adoption. <laughs> We're going to credit your granddaughter. I'd like that statement, <laughs> child. All, any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand, please. Passed Thank you very much, and thank you for all the people that did. This is hard work, and it's hard work uh, for everybody, the solicitor, the commission, the council. And so thanks. Phew. Okay, meeting's adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> all in favor, say aye. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, we're moving on now to the board of Licensing commissioners. The first request, Councilor, you want to go over that for us? Um, it'll need licenses. It's just the annual renewal. We're going to be um, issuing them for the period of time from April to November so that we can, we're in the process of trying to get all the licenses due at the same time. So this is just the annual renewal. Motion to. It, it can't be an annual renewal if we're only going for a partial season. We're going to bring it to a new annual date. You're right. We're going from April to These are a partial, November. so these are not an annual. Okay. An annual partial? It's, it's the adjustment of the annual. annual renewal, but not for an annual term. <coughs> okay, but I, mean, I, I think we have to make these people very clear because in the past, you know, they, if you did something did annually, an annual I want to see people's licenses expiring, so you know. are getting a letter and the license stipulates the date on it, so we've done what we can to. And if the fee is prorated for the amount of time. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion. Motion to approve the victoring license subject to meeting all legal requirements and proper notification. <laughs> that's, that's micromanaging. That's micromanaging. Well, make sure they're and notified. Payment. And, and well, fees, right, Carol? Already. And payment of all fees. And payment of all, that's meeting legal requirements. <laughs> and submitted it okay. in English. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries. <laughs> Next item, town clerk. Uh, this is the same um, same idea. It's for the renewal on the antique licenses. Again, it will be from April through November. Motion to approve the antique license, meeting all legal requirements. Second. All those in favor. Financial business. Town administrator. Madam President, uh, I have a request to release the carry forward and drainage and paving camp um, 9955 
four seven nine four uh, an amount of four thousand thirty one dollars and five cents to the uh, the current account. So moved. Second. Um, just maybe you could explain. I mean, is it ninety nine something that's been sitting around since nineteen ninety nine? And so we do it fiscally, or how is this account different? Ninety nine. That's a carry forward account. At the end of each fiscal year, um, the council gives the various departments permission to sweep certain monies into an account. Uh, if we have any leftover money in, for instance, and we usually for the PPW put it into a drainage and paving account, so that money can be carried forward into the next fiscal year. We're releasing it into the into this to the normal operating account, which is five five four. 794. That 99 is an indication of a carry forward account. The, the situation was at one time a carry forward account was automatically just carried to the account, the same account in the, in the next year. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, the council took an action and basically allowed carry forward funds and not to be released without council approval. So these, instead of just going directly into next year's account, have to be brought back to the council and ask for permission to use them in that. And we've always done that with the paving and drainage. How much is going in the paving account and how much is being used for engineering services? Uh, Dave, on the engineering services for Robert Gray, $58,000. I believe it's $52,000. And do we have paid for probably about uh, 80 to 90 percent of that out of this year's operating budget. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. The motion carries. Next. Uh, the next one is a uh, request for transfer of funds due to the shortfall in the rubbish recycling account. Uh, as you know, the contract was approved after the financial town meeting. There is one mistake where it says, uh, where Nancy has put 2B. It actually should be 5541574080. Even though it's the duplicate account, we break this down between the landfill, um, sick leave account, and the rest of DPW internally. So it's all the same account, it's just an, an internal. So it should be $5,635.21. I had a question on, on this as well. What? No, no, you, you confused us. The first one was you release in 2483.87 from the sand and gravel to the rubbish recycling, not the sick leave. Okay, I've got this. I see what you, okay. I put this in a different way then. On, in my notice, then where Nancy has it. 2A is release of carry forward funds, 9955469. There was $2,483.87. Release that into the rubbish recycling account. Right. Yes. The second one, which is 2B. That's a, that's a second, requires a second motion. Okay. Just a quick question on, on that rubbish recycling. How much more? For sure, we're going to have an account. Okay, in, in the in the notes in your packet, it says uh, under explanation, it says there's thirty-five thousand two hundred seventy-nine dollars and forty-two cents if both of these items are approved. But why why are we doing this piecemeal? All we're doing is transferring two thousand four eighty-three into the recycling rubbish recycling. We need forty-five. I looked at the uh, what is left in our balance and we have enough for a couple of months so why this will this will get us by making these transfers this will give us enough to get all the way through to the end of May and when we hit sometime in eight, late April early May take a look at where we are with our accounts and make the final transfers into those accounts I know I guess my question is why not do it in May when we actually know where because we are. I'm trying to take a very systematic look at finding out where we're going to stand without getting a lot of surprises at the very end I'm going back and looking at, at, at legal accounts these accounts where I know we have shortfalls that were never anticipated in the budget process last year um, 
you know, I'm just trying to work these numbers down as I get fur further along. I mean, we know that we've had a shortfall in other accounts, which I gave you a memo in January. We're getting ready to follow up with another one. I thought I would have it for you by the time your packets went out. It's not ready. To give you an idea, this line is short here, this line is short here, and this line is short here. You're not answering my question. Well, I thought I had. My that. question is, why are we doing this piecemeal? I understand there's a shortfall. You've told us that, et cetera. But why are we just transferring? Why not wait until we have a clearer picture as to what we need and what the accounts are? Okay, well, let's try multiple accounts at the same time so we can see where the big transfer is. Drain, as drain, opposed to okay. nickel and dining. Drain, drain that account right down and then do the transfer. Do we, make, do we make payments on these things on a monthly, a quarterly well, we basis? Do. We do. We have okay. Right, right, the, right now, if we make these, though these are small transfers, this will get us through to the end of May. We will then will have to address the issue in June for the balance of what is left because our annual trash, our monthly trash bill is approximately $47,000 a month. Yes. I mean, it's probably more my style, which is different from what I'm more comfortable doing this way. I have no problem going back and holding it the other way. It's just maybe more of a style difference than anything else. Well, I think, from the, at least from my standpoint, I like to see the whole picture. One swoop, okay, this is what we have to do. This is where the accounts will come from. This will bring us, and it will close out the shortfall. We have 137000 left at 47 a month. We should be able to get through three, uh, three months. That was dated the end of February. Well, let me see. I mean, I'm not. I mean, that, that was my point. So it's just, as I, mean, I said, it's just well, more style than anything else, Madam President. Sorry. Well, okay. I, I'm not really big on you know these small, constant transfers. I think some of them, are, but some of them are closing out accounts. So you limit you you so know what what you're doing is you, you're taking and reducing the number of carry forward accounts that are sitting there because you're not sure what you want to do with the rest of it for other shortfalls. And I agree with it, it's a style issue. It's just well, I don't know, because yeah. you know, it's hard I can remember when Mr. Sousa was sitting where you were sitting, and, and we had, you know, the role of the solicitors are the administrators to identify the shortfall and give us the accounts where it can be taken as sort of one picture. And that is where we are. That's where I am. So anyway, we'll take a motion on this. Uh, I'll motion to uh, release the carry forward funds of the 2483-87 from uh, sand and gravel and transfer it to uh, rubbish and recycling. I'll second that. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed, four to two. Motion carries. Three to two. Three to two. No, no, no. Oh, four. Was it four? Oh, I'm sorry. Three two. <coughs> four. four. Okay. We're well, only we missing one. Okay. And did we vote on the... No, we didn't do B. We didn't do B. B. Uh, I will uh, also motion for 2B, which is the request for transfer from the uh, uh, public work sick leave, the 554150 of 489441, and from account uh, 554240 uniform account. That should be 450 also, sir, too, please. Okay. It's how we split uh, the account in but, terms uh, Seven seven forty eighty to the count four fifty four fifty seven the rubbish and recycling. I'll second that. All those in favor? Those opposed? Two. Just to let four you know, two. Glenn, I, I I too, although I made I second it, I too would much rather see an account be drained down as much as it could before we start transferring stuff. Just to let you know that. Okay. I just think it looks better and it gives us a better idea of what's going on with it. Well, some of this is... I know it's a style, but... And, um, and, and it's also the next issue is, is cleaning out and actually releasing back to the general fund some monies as now that we are reaching the end of a our month nine from months. Now, a month from now, we'll probably be transferring the, that same account over into it, what we just did <coughs> now. But it would probably look a lot better a month from now or two months from now if we had to do it versus draining that account down when, at the appropriate time. Just, I know it's just a manager in style, but sometimes it looks better doing it that way. Okay, okay next item. These, these next are 
I want to see how you've got it in the agenda versus how I put it in my agenda request. All right, the first one um, is account number 9910601, code enforcement personnel in the amount of $2,450.70. I would like that. We don't need that in carry forward. That can be released. The second one, which is 9921201, tax assessor personnel to release 794 to general fund. Account number, same account number, tax assessor personnel, transfer to uh, the current fiscal year, 2012-101. That'll clear out that carry forward account. 99513 maintenance personnel, release 795.76 to the general fund. And an E in that same account, transfer over to the current fiscal year account, 513101, $208, $208.49. According to downstairs, those are the shortfalls in those accounts. I'd like to make a motion to um, in account 99-212-101, tax assessor personnel for the 1350 to the current fiscal year 212-101, and E in account 99-513-101, maintenance personnel for 208-49 to the current fiscal year 513-101. I'm not in favor of transferring funds or releasing funds to the general fund until we get into our May or June because we may need to grab something for a shortfall. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the idea of that is. I would be much more uh, content in going back to the general fund when we get into our May meeting, you know, or after we see the end, near our, the end of our fiscal year to know that we're all set. Mm -hmm. I'm more than happy to put those monies back in the general fund, but I don't want to do it prematurely. But isn't it, true, isn't it true that the funds are not used, they automatically go into the general yeah, fund? It doesn't really yeah. require so, a vote, yeah. but I agree with you. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd much rather wait until I'll second we it, Tom. Second it, Tom. Okay. Just, uh, just for the record, you know, I am doing everything uh, within my power to be respectful of the salary accounts, as has been mm -hmm. uh, reiterated to me by the council and to the budget committee. And um, I felt pretty comfortable, just so you know, just to clear out that section of the carry forwards and yep. to release back. That's the only reason why I recommended that. I, I, I understand that, and, and we have been very good mm -hmm. in watching the differences between the salary accounts and the operating accounts. And again, you know, we asked for, and I think we've been very diligent in how we've handled that. But I'd like to see that money's available if need be, because, you know, emergencies have a way of yep. rearing their ugly head when there's no money and, you know, <laughs> and if there's something there to do it from, it's a little more comfort situation. It's a long way from uh, the end of June. Yeah, and also the other nightmare that probably is on everybody's mind as we head into the financial town meeting, that if we don't get a majority vote on the waiver of the debt service, we're going to be in very grave trouble. So I think you're right. <coughs> so your motion is for C and E to approve. Um, except for the uh, uh, carryover. I haven't done, I, I just, uh, on item number three, subsection C and E, I've made a motion to allow that okay. uh, to go to I, the I current fiscal year. And uh, yes, okay. It's just a, how does it put together? Okay, uh, there's, there's a second to that motion. Second. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Okay, next item, town administrator. This is under new business, and uh, I'm gonna ask Mr. Webster to come forward. Uh, as you know, um, we are in the process of getting ready to change uh, service companies for disposal. Um, Patriot Disposal, as of July the 1st, will be our new trash collector. Uh, they had contacted Mr. Webster in regards to a proposal that they submitted uh, to us for consideration. And in light of your conversations and part of your list of goals was to increase recycling by the town residents. Um, this, I'm going to let Dave speak more to it, but this is maybe an alternative to, um, it's a um, limited model of a, of a potentially of a pay-as-you-throw concept 
uh, versus what had originally been discussed a couple years ago before I got here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Steve. Yes, actually this came out of the result of a conversation we had, Mr. Steckman and I had with the trash hauler uh, Patriot Disposal uh, back when we were having discussions about awarding the contract uh, to that company uh, back in January. And it was mentioned that uh, about the automated system and that it could perhaps save both the town and the contractor money. The uh, contractor did indicate at that time he'd be willing to look at that option. Uh, that's why the contractor's representative came back to me uh, earlier this month. And his proposal was to prov that the contractor would provide a 65-gallon toter. A toter means a, uh, a barrel that's on wheels uh, that could be wheeled out to the curbside. Uh, their proposal is that they would limit the collections at each household to the emptying of that one toter uh, per week. Uh, any additional trash would be up to the residents to bring, bring down to the landfill, or alternatively, they would have to purchase another toter and pay the town for, or the contractor for that uh, uh, toter and additional trash. Uh, even though there would be an eight-week eight yard waste collection, um, uh, the, this would have an impact on the yard waste that would go out during the rest of the year. As you know right now, there is no limit on the amount of trash that any resident can put out at the curbside. If they have five barrels out there, that's what's picked up. Also, it not only would it have an impact on the, on the yard waste that, that potentially could be put out, it also would impact uh, large items because large items naturally could not be put into that 65-gallon toter. <coughs> so the only way that they could take care, we could then take care of the large items, we would have to have a program similar uh, to what we have for metal, pick, metal collections. Um, th that brings us to, that takes care of the trash, then we also talked about how the recyclables would be handled because if they pick up the uh, trash with an automated system, one man uh, system, uh, they would want to pick up the recyclables the same way. Uh, they proposed purchasing uh, new 30 gallon green and blue toters. Uh, they would pick up the uh, green uh, container on alternate weeks uh, and on the opposite weeks, uh, the blue container would be picked up. I did speak with Resource Recovery. They've given an indication that they could fund uh, some of the cost of those toters, uh, but that it would be up to the town to purchase uh, the remainder of them. And that would cost the town $180,000, which at this point, I don't know where uh, we would uh, get that kind of money. Um, so th the reason this was, again, that this was proposed is because of uh, that some interest was expressed about this automated collection system. Uh, this program is modeled after the Brockton Mass System that uh, Allied uh, has uh, uh, been servicing in Brockton. Uh, I don't think that it does the pay-as-you-throw program as was proposed by the landfill subcommittee. Uh, I can't say that I'm uh, a big proponent of this. While I like the idea of automated collection, I think that at this time with such short, short notice, uh, I, I couldn't say that I would uh, uh, recommend this to the council. But that's, it's brought to you because it is a policy decision. We have the opportunity to do this now. Uh, the contractor would not be receptive to doing it a year from now. Uh, because he has to make a, a purchase of specialized equipment to make this happen. Thank you. I think, and we <laughs> wanted to make sure this was brought to your attention in light of your conversations of increasing recycling, because obviously there would be an opportunity here. Um, and um, obviously the tremendous investment that they're going to make in type of a trash truck, they just can't change trash trucks in, in midstream in the contract without some type of substantial negotiation. So 
we bring it to your attention, whether you act upon it, it doesn't really make any difference. We want to make sure you were aware of this. Good. Madam President, can yeah, I make a quick comment regarding uh, recycling? Mr. Bennis, come forward. Thank you. I've been doing a lot of walking lately, and I've noticed violations in the recycling ordinance in roughly 50% of the blue and green bins that I think people probably have gotten unaware of what they're supposed to be doing with the green and blue bins since it was originally set up. And I think the present uh, contractor is not leaving the, the appropriate stickers notifying people that they're in violation. He's doing half of the work and leaving the RARRC to do the other half of the work. There's three things that I'd like to bring to your attention that should be brought to the public's attention. The blue bin is for aluminum and metal cans and number one and two plastics, not paper and not plastics and paper bags. I've seen numerous people putting out plastic inside of a paper bag. Uh, second item, all plastic and metal lids for jars and bottles should be discarded in the trash except for the metal lids for glass jars. <coughs> and those can be placed in the blue bin. I'd say 40% of people are putting out the wrong number of plastics and they're putting out the right number of plastics with caps on them. That can be a problem and I'm surprised that we haven't run into a problem with the recycling uh, people up in Johnston complaining. The third item is that the green bin is for paper and cardboard, not for plastic and not in number two plastic bags. I've seen newspaper in number two plastic bags. And that's not allowed either. And I think it's partly the fault of people being careless and partly the fault of the present company that's collecting stuff and not putting the sticker on. I talked to one of these guys collecting and I said, I asked him what he was doing and he said, well, uh, if they put the, uh, the newspaper in a plastic bag, we dump it we dump the newspaper in the paper and we took the, take the plastic bag and we throw it. So he's doing part of the work and part of it, like the caps, I'm sure he's not taking every cap off and throwing it in the trash. So it's something that maybe with a little publicity in the newspapers, if somebody here from the newspapers could bring some of that to people's attention and maybe if the new recycling committee would uh, post the item from the RIRRC, or they can contact me and I can send it to them in soft copy to be posted on the website so people can go on and get the latest up-to-date regulations and re-inform themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Certainly, uh, you're right in some respects. I have, we all have the same concerns. I, so. I believe the new recycler may be a shock to people if they're not informed in advance. He may start rejecting half of the recyclables. I know. Madam President, what we'll do is ask the recycling committee and make sure we post it on the website the proper way to, for recycling. Um, and we'll get a press release out. Okay, next item. Uh, Madam Chairman? Yes. Before we go on to the next item, I think this proposal, uh, I think there's a lot of merit to these ideas that are being furnished. And in spite of what somebody said here tonight, there is a thinker or two uh, in the town, and somebody might come up with an idea that will permit the adoption of this if that's what we want. So I would suggest we carry this forward maybe a month from now or a month and a half from now and give up people some time to think it over. Why won't be enough time to get the uh, contract? It won't be. The contract uh, starts have. July 1st, right? You mean this requires an immediate decision? Yeah. No. Yeah, we have that. No. They, they have to order trucks. It's not like going down and purchasing a car. This is specialized equipment, and it takes months in advance to, to order it. In fact, I'm surprised they haven't already ordered it. It's one of those arms that takes a month. Yeah, yeah. Even, even a regular trash truck, it's, it's going to take months to get it in. Thank you. Okay. Next item. Timbert, we have the... Um you have the Tiverton Little Compton Pause Watch. I gave you a packet of information uh, about my conversations with the uh, ladies and, and, and gentlemen from this group, and I believe they're here in the audience tonight to talk to you. Uh, as you're aware, we are um, 
going out to bid and you will have a uh, request for bid proposal at your next meeting. Uh, the police department is now in the process of updating it. Our current package program only allows for the dogs to be kept as a dog town. We are asking for a, I don't want to say a cat component, but a cat option so that uh, we can deal with the uh, issue of feral cats and unfortunately dumped domesticated cats that have become a problem in the community. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Bell has been working with people with the feral cats, providing them cages and working with the, with the friends group and trying to uh, provide some homes, but we really do not have a policy or procedure in place at this particular point in time. Mrs. Plunkett, state your name. Virginia Plunkett, 266 Indian Point Road. And he's just taken my speech. <laughs> I'll give it anyway. <laughs> um, we at, uh, from Paws Watch and Placing Paws are here tonight to discuss some issues concerning the cat population in Tiverton, a problem that we feel needs to be addressed by the town. We have an abundance of lost and abandoned cats as well as feral ones, those born and raised in the wild. Paws Watch is attempting to address the problem of our feral cat population. It is part of a national organization that attempts to trap, neuter, and release these cats to reduce their population. A chapter of this organization was found, founded here in Tiverton and Little Compton about a year and a half ago. Already they have rescued more than 200 cats, many of these coming from colonies of 10 or more cats in one location. Paws Watch relies on donations and on local vets who offer them special rates and who donate some of their time to the cause. Our animals are taken to veterinarians in Fall River and North Dartmouth. You have some information from <clears throat> about feral cats in your packet that we gave you, and we would also like to leave some brochures here and with the animal control officer for anyone who may be interested. In their catch and neuter program, Paws Watch has come across many cats who are not feral but rather domestic cats who have been either lost or abandoned. These are the cats we are concerned with tonight. Our town ordinance, chapter 10, article one, section two, has only one regulation. It shall be unlawful for any person to abandon any cat on any street, highway, or public place within the town. That's it. At present, Tiverton has no provision for animal control officer duties and responsibilities or for shelter agreements to handle these cats. Let me give you a couple of recent examples to illustrate the problem. In October, a friend found a cat on her deck. It was crying and wanted to come in. She ignored it. The next day, he is back again. Again, he was crying, lifting his paws up to the door to come in and appeared to be hungry and thin. She ignored him. When he came again on the third day, she gave in and fed him on the deck, was able to pick him up and pet him. This was not a feral cat. She then attempted to report a found cat. She called the police department. They said they didn't handle cats. Sakana Vets, our contract shelter, said they didn't take cats. And Forever Paws said it couldn't take any more cats. The dilemma, there is no place to post a lost cat description no place to take it, and no advice on what to do next. After checking again with the neighbors to make sure it didn't belong to anyone, she gave us a call, knowing that we had recently lost our cat. We took it, went to the vet, discovered, it, discovered that it had been neutered, was healthy, and less than a year old. This definitely was a domestic cat who obviously had been owned and cared for at one time. A second example. We are in the process of checking out a small feral cat population in our neighborhood. One cat was recently lured in, caught, and took to the vet, and it turned out to be already neutered and about five years old. He'd become part of a feral group we'd been watching for over a year. In reality, he was another domestic cat. He's now our outside cat, very friendly, and content to stay in our yard and sleep and eat in the greenhouse. These two cats belong in our lost and abandoned category. They are not feral. At this time, 
if a family, for whatever reason, a move, sickness, entering a nursing home, for example, has to give up their cat, there's no one to contact, no place to take him where he can be taken care of and hopefully adopted out. Cats are not even mentioned in our town's rules, regulations, or contract agreements. So, if a relative or neighbor cannot step in, they may have no other recourse but to leave him behind in the hope that he can defend for himself. The same is true if you find a lost cat. You want to be responsible by reporting it, but there's no one in town to help you. These are the cats who end up being abandoned. Then they reproduce and eventually, without any human contact, form feral colonies, hopefully learning how to hunt and survive. It is these cats, before they are lost and abandoned, whose needs must be addressed and included in our animal control officer's job description. Here would be someone who could re respond to citizens who have concerns about a lost, either theirs or someone else's cat, or who need assistance when it may become necessary to surrender a cat. Our town administrator has been approached about this problem. With a new animal control officer, it would be an appropriate time to make any changes in his duties. Our understanding is that he is amenable to working with the police department to add wording which would include cats. Also, at this time, the police department is in the process of putting together a new contract for our animal shelter. That contract expires at the end of June. Hopefully, it too will reflect the need to provide for cats as well as dogs. To offer some assistance in this process, we have obtained copies of the duties of the animal control officer and of the agreement with the Potter League Shelter from the towns of Portsmouth and Middletown. You have received copies of these documents. At this time, we would like your permission and endorsement to give copies to our town administrator and the police department who will be amending and working on these contracts. We feel that they will be useful as examples of language that includes all animals. It is our hope that these additions will result in aid and protection for our cats, which so far have been left out. We are very willing to offer our help and support the town to meet any new commitments. Paws Watch and Placing Paws will remain committed to assisting with low-cost spaying and neutering of cats, helping to control the feral cat population, as well as responding to families who may need help with their animals. Together, we hope that this will serve to bring the feral as well as the lost and abandoned cat population under control. Thank you. You know, I don't think we have copies of the contracts. I didn't um, duplicate the copies of the contracts for everyone, but we do have copies, so I don't know if Glenn already has any. We can certainly give them to them. Does council wish to have copies of all yeah, these other communities? Good. Well, I, I think we'd like a sample of uh, the contracts. Well, we'll, so we'll take a put them in the box. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. You have been very active and good advocates. So um, as the town administrator said, uh, we are putting an option in our uh, new contract as it goes out uh, to bid. So hopefully we can. Do you mind just giving them a copy of the other towns so that they can use this in their? Absolutely. I mean, the okay. more information we have, the better. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item. Madam uh, President, I have for you and the council and request your approval of a contract extension for David Webster, our DPW director, uh, from the end of his current truck contract of May 16th to extend it to September 13th of 2007. With great regret uh, on my part, and I know on your part, Mr. Webster has announced his retirement I have told him he is too young to retire and that he will miss us greatly, as we will miss him greatly. And uh, talking with the town solicitor, um, you have the extension employment agreement that was included in your packet um, to amend the current contract in these sections.
Motion to approve the contract extension for the Dave Webster from May 16, 2007 to September 13, 2007. Second. Any further discussion? I'm hoping in the next four months we can persuade Mr. Webster to change his mind. <laughs> so that's the only reason why I would even consider voting for this. Madam President, I tried to, I offered him all sorts of options to uh, consider staying from one year, two year, or as his three year agreement. And if I can twist his arm to stay longer than that, but he has also made an indication that he does not want to go through another winter. Also, he thinks we have run our luck on relatively mild winners. And if we vote not approved. He leaves the 17th of May, which I don't think. <laughs> doesn't quite give us enough time to go right. through the process. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor? Reluctantly. I figured the options are, are limited, May 16th to September. Yeah. <laughs> I like September better. Uh, next item. Uh, this is a request that was in your packet to go out for an RFQ for landscaping, park, and architectural service for the redevelopment of Fulgur Marsh Park. And I would like to add some information because I think there, through the budget process, there has been lost some information in the bigger picture. Um, and I want to make sure everybody understands. And uh, last February, we were awarded an $18,000 matching grant for the improvements to the basketball courts. Uh, in the conversation with the Recreation Commission, it became aware that the town could be eligible for a master planning pro grant, uh, a, a large grant application to up to a $300,000 matching grant, but we would really need to do a master plan for the park. Um, the, the Recreation Commission has taken the position, instead of just simply spending $18,000 from the state and $18,000 in matching services and in-kind services and cash and building a new basketball court and finding it's in the wrong location as to the master plan. They wanted to go out and hire a professional company to do a new, an updated master plan. They are here tonight to request your approval to go out to bid, to negotiate a contract and bring the contract back to you for your approval. Uh, I have spoken with Mr. Dias, Joe Dias of RIDEM, who oversees this program and has made it very clear to me today that these monies for the basketball part can last up to two years and a waiver can be given to extend the period of time as long as they feel there is good faith on part of the community. I have for you, in light of the conversation I had with a couple people, a timeline so you know what timeline that we're working with, which does leave the opportunity that once a master plan is accepted and approved, that this fall it's very possible that the basketball courts could go forward as we wait the approval for the rest of the money, which we hope would be forthcoming. Uh, while no promises can be made, uh, in my conversation with Mr. Dyes, and I have a letter here that I'm going to also give you a copy of, he was quite pleased to hear that the town of Tiverton was going to this effort to develop this master plan. And uh, he wanted to make sure that I conveyed to everybody that this was the right step to do and would also earn us bonus points in this, grant, this master large grant application. Um, so pending your approval, if we go out for the RFQ, you would be looking at hopefully approving sometime uh, an exception by the end of April from the Recreation Committee to allow them to go negotiate with a, um, with, and with my assistance, a contract for a uh, architect. 
And here is the letter also that was sent to Mr. Dias. A copy has been also um, here. Excuse me. Sorry about that, Andy. I think there's become a lot of excitement in the community, especially when they saw the fencing come down around the old tennis courts that we were ready to break ground that day. Uh, and I think some people thought that by withdrawing the money out of the uh, current budget that we were still not going to be going out and seeking money. The or Oransky um, Foundation it could not make it at their last meeting, but they are already working on developing a fundraising activity. And uh, we plan on going to various foundations and banks and asking for their financial support uh, with this process. I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve the seeking of the request for qualifications for the uh, proposed redevelopment of Bogomash Park. Is there a second? Second. Um, one thing I would like to see too, before we uh, tangentially, is where the match, where the monies will come from for the match to make sure this gets done. Uh, with that, uh, all those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Motion. I will say that we are just in the first steps because we were also going to ask the uh, company that hopefully is a successor that they have experience in grant writing to assist us and to identify potential funding sources that we may not be aware of. Uh, Mr. Webster. Good evening again. You have uh, in your package a request to advertise for bids for a, a 1.5 ton vibratory roller for the DPW. Uh, we're asking for this so that we can improve the quality of the work that we're doing. Currently, anytime we have to do uh, asphalt patches out there with a uh, plate compactor uh, trying to do the job. While that's okay for small, small areas, anytime we have a uh, uh, extended area or a, uh, a trench across the road, uh, it's much more productive and efficient to uh, have this type of a roller uh, that we do not have available to us. Uh, so we're asking to uh, uh, be able to go out to bid for this and to take the money from the uh, 554794 paving and drainage account uh, to purchase it at an estimated cost of $12,200. Mr. Webster. Would the use of this kind of equipment remove some of the bumps that we now have on these trenches that go across the road? Uh, we don't do all of the trenches. Uh, many of the trenches are repaired by utility contractors, and I think you know how I feel about uh, utility patches, <laughs> if you've uh, heard me before about utility cuts. Uh, we will do the best we can with, with the trenches that we uh, make repairs to, and hopefully to give a quality patch. That's what our goal is here. I think that this piece of equipment is going to help us in stretching our paving dollar by being able to do some of those larger jobs that we can't do, and we've got to go out and contract for that patchwork, where if we have that equipment and uh, seeing there's money in the drainage and paving account, I think it's an addition that the uh, highway department with 100 miles of road to service is a welcome addition. I'll make a motion that we approve the request for to advertise for bids for the one and a half ton vibrating roller. There's a second. second. All those in favor? Raise your right hand. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is the fire chief. Oh, county minister. We have uh, some announcements. I would ask the fire chief to come forward to acknowledge um, letters uh, that he has received on behalf of his personnel. Uh, I have been trying to use this portion of my time over the last few months to recognize our employees because so often we hear complaints we seldom hear the good things and the exceptional jobs so I would ask the fire chief to speak highly of his men which will, if this recognition is well deserved. What I have presented to you is just several of the letters that I receive on a daily basis about our, our firefighters who do a great deal of work in this community. Um, again, I'm trying to bring to you what the citizens are feeling about the, the personnel that we employ within this town. I think sometimes we don't give them the credit that they deserve, that 
they do go the extra mile. They go quite a long ways. Um, it just happens that a lot of the people you're getting these letters from today all happen to be working within the several uh, same days of one another, so they, they did fall on one another, but there are numerous other ones that I get, and I would like to try to forward those to you so that you have an understanding of uh, what the employees of this town do for you. Well noted. Thank you, sir. Very nice, Chief. And as always, with any of our employees, when we get these letters, we do include it in their personnel files uh, so that uh, it can be taken in consideration. Unfortunately, we don't have that option of rewarding them because of the way the contracts, but we are going to start making sure that our certain employees, whether in the police or fire, have public condemnation, commendation ceremonies. Uh, yes, I've heard that too but public commendation ceremonies to recognize that uh, we do need to see their, their hard work. Uh, the next thing for you is just to give you... Madam President, yes. <clears throat> may I, through you, commend the chief for the way he is dressed. There was apparently no grass fires today, but I think he looks terrific. Thank you, Mr. Costa. He was uh, at uh, the State House representing us today. It was an honor of you, sir. Oh, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. <laughs> and we do check him for grass stains when he comes in. We, uh, we have really nothing to add to that fine statement, so. No, thank you. Okay. Um, the, the last item, I have a couple more items, but I wanted to give you the updated financial statement in terms of what we're looking for proposed re revenue. Just so you know, um, Mr. Robert and the uh, treasurer are looking at these numbers so that we make sure we have better numbers and, for, and um, better estimates. Last year, unfortunately, um, when we found ourselves having to make abatement changes after the financial town meeting, uh, because we were over optimistic on the Starwood prorations and because of a motor vehicle shortfall, we ended up being short in revenue that we had projected by over $250,000. So as we become more fine tuning our revenue, it's critical that we be accurate. Um, so we'll continue to work on this. Madam President, I one request on these. Show changes. Please. Okay. I mean, an italics or bold or something because. Yeah, I, I have went through uh, over the weekend the changes, and it is helpful to reflect the changes in red or there is, blue. But there is one change that was highlighted all the way on the last page um, where we're showing um, because of where the treasurer had indicated, I believe, $891,000 would go over the debt cap that we'd have to find that money. We actually only have to find right now if everything continues to work through the process and fees are increased, 633000 While that is a lot of money, it is still a lot better than $891,000. Um, and in light of talking about taxes, the tax collector's office will be open this Saturday. Uh, from 9 a.m. to 12.30 for fourth quarter taxes. Um, we, will not be, we will not be open, um, dare I say, Easter weekend um, on that uh, Saturday morning uh, because it, we look at it as a three-day holiday for our employees. So this will be, well, Saturday of the 31st will be our only additional day. We find, we found that is enough uh, we will be advertising this is on the website. It's been posted on the doors of Town Hall. It's up at the Senior Center. It's up at the library. And we'll be putting a press release out to the newspapers. So you're urging our citizens to pay their taxes early? Early and often. And often. And often. We will take the often. Um, before the meeting started, I did speak to Mr. Robert, our tax assessor, with regard to making sure that we're honing in on the tax rate. Yes, ma'am. Um, because the, um, uh, we need to get some reports to municipal affairs. Yes, ma'am. And I'm getting a little nervous. Well, the letter. It requires the chief elected officer in the town to do certain things. Um, and I just, I wanna make sure we have some, 
We should be in a position soon to do some draft of what the docket's going to look like. Well, that's what we're, that's in fact the budget committee was talking about that at their uh, last meeting. And I did speak to Mr. Carter today, um, uh, urging him to meet with the council, and he was going to set some dates. I don't have those dates, but um, just to go over some of the things that you know we, because there are some still some issues out there, but. We should be close to honing in on, you know, where we are. And I think that's a matter that's going to affect all the townspeople. So. And I think everybody, I can promise everybody, is very much aware of that. And I think uh, maybe at this Thursday night they may be talking about some additional meetings next week to wrap to get things tied down so it's not a race to the finish. Uh, I just want to make sure everybody also knows. I'm sure you found it on your your desk, but. Um, our town planner will be speaking at the community forum, planning Tiverton's future. Uh, Chris Spencer will be speaking on Wednesday night, March 28th, uh, this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. at St. Teresa's Church. The public is invited and refreshments are served. And then the last is from Mr. Ruggiero regarding the Shore Road. Uh, his available dates. <laughs> Um, or this Thursday, which is probably too short to get everybody together, and April the 30th, which is a Monday night, which would be the fifth Monday night of the month of April. Uh, May 3rd, which is a Thursday, and he can also meet alternately as an alternative between 6 or 6.30 before the planning board for zoning boards meet, which I think is might be a little tight on time considering the, the seriousness of the issue and the convolution of the issue. Well, the 30th, the town council workshop. It's already a workshop, yeah. So it's we're, that we're fifth be, Monday, yeah, so. You know, yeah. So yeah. might as well have them come that night. 30th, 30th. 30th March. Um, what time? <laughs> Well, he, he didn't split a time, but I would say 7 p.m. If you want to meet earlier, he can do it earlier. Why don't we leave it at 7? We will Jerry notify will him tonight. Give us the legal advice you wanted before making a decision on Shore Road. Yep. Yeah. It was just that would the council feel more comfortable meeting him? So, okay. <coughs> Very good. Are we scheduling him? Yes. No, we're here on the 30th, so we're just telling him to come to our workshop. We'll just post, it. We'll post that as a, as a special council meeting. I didn't know we had a okay. workshop scheduled for the 30th. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't remember anybody oh, making it. It's on your calendar. All the fifth Mondays, Doc. <laughs> was that motion made and approved? That calendar was approved. I think you seconded it. I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I've been involved with my, my grandchild screaming. <laughs> I <didn't get> it. <laughs> if she wasn't screaming so loud. Okay. <laughs> Moving on now, folks. And, and the last thing is I want to, we welcomed on a new officer who is going in, I shouldn't say officer yet, he's in training, Sean Lafferty. We participated uh, jointly in a hiring process with all the police departments from Newport County. There were over 313 applications received. 168 took the agility to exam. Uh, 64 failed, leaving 104 candidates for the written exam, and 55 passed the written exam. Um, it, I would say that I think uh, the deputy chief is here. We were very pleased with the young man that we have hired to come on to the police department. and. Um, we were very pleased with the, with the quality of candidates that we had applying. We, we could not have gone wrong with any of them. So everybody has been very pleased in the various police departments joining together in this effort. Okay. And when he is ready to come out of the academy, we'll have him here for swearing in and you can meet him personally. Okay. Will refreshments be served? Nope. <laughs> that is hey, Dan? That's just Matt Murtha. Um uh, I did put on the agenda uh, this uh, question about wind power, and I think this is something that we should begin to seriously talk about in the town. And um, I think the school department is receptive, as I had a very brief conversation, and it was brief, with Mr. Rarick. Um, uh, and just before the meeting, Brian had some information um, that maybe as a way to proceed, my first thought was perhaps to set up a committee 
with somebody from the school, town administrator, maybe from somebody from the economic development, our new commission, somebody from conservation commission, member of the council, small committee, to just explore the ways of how to get started. You know, are the grants, can we take a look at it? But then Brian came along and, Brian? Well, there's an organization that's involved with a lot of the towns with, with uh, proposing wind power and different alternatives and presenting the information. The gentleman from the organization is willing to come do a half hour presentation to talk about funding, talk about all the environmental issues, to talk about the benefits and provide that information. So if the council is interested in hearing from him. Hey, and the workshop on the 30th. Yeah. I, I can suggest that thing. I believe it's also going to be a uh, seminar at Roger Williams. Right, University. April 19 and 20. Yes. And they, he said apparently there are two seats that are being reserved for Tiverton right. officials. So if, if well, Friday, we want to come up with somebody to Get attend that money. meeting, there will be a, there's going to be a lot of information April. provided again April. about the environmental. They're going to have presenters. It's going to be a pretty major thing at Roger Williams on the 19th and the 20th. We haven't gotten any information. It's Thursday, Friday. It's during the day. We haven't gotten any information on it. Um, I talked to the uh, it's president of the town council in Bristol. He can give me a bunch of information. Uh, okay, so I asked him to send the information to you. April 30th. Just so you know, Monday. Yeah. it has been it's discussed of placing one eventually up yes. at the landfill uh, in yeah. that area because it's getting nice and high up there. Mm. Uh, but ha that has been given some consideration by the landfill subcommittee eventually as putting one or recommending one up there. But uh, I would recommend, I, have no, I think this is something we need to take a look at. But the time is nigh because the grants are being reduced dramatically every year. I mean, Portsmouth Abbey received somewhere in the region of like $500,000. Now the grants are down to fifty. I agree. I mean, I don't disagree. I mean, the grants, the monies are, are declining rapidly because a gentleman came in and spoke to the Conservation Commission on this various process from the Rhode Island Energy Department, and I don't know, it may be the same individual. I don't know. Yeah, I'm just going to, Tom Ramitowski from Conservation, is going to point out that there's a gentleman on the governor's staff that we had brought in and, and talked to our commission about this, and uh, you're right, some of the grants are decreasing, and also the size of the structures are going up, which mm -hmm. makes them more expensive. The one at Portsmouth Abbey is now considered medium to small, it's medium to small to yes. what you can now buy or what's now available. They also pointed out that we may have some potential for tidal uh, type power as well uh, through the uh, Sakonet River that flows by the town. So that's another thing to consider. But uh, he, he does put on a very nice presentation. It's very knowledgeable. Well, um, let's, I, I think we should take <coughs> this person uh, on, on our April 30th uh, agenda. He's going to send information to Glenn and he'll distribute it to us in terms of what the organization is and what, what they provide and, and his offer to come. Okay, and we probably should invite the Economic um, Development Commission as well as... Um, Conservation. Yeah. One thing about this town, wind we have. <laughs> we may not have industry, we but have, we have and, wind. And we have some heights, too. So. Yeah. We have some places to take advantage of. It. Just one of the four. So, oops, so having some April 30th. Uh, uh, Meeting at Roger Williams. Uh, um, yes. On the 19th. And the 20th. Yeah. If we could find out some more. I will get as much information as I can. Okay. Now, town solicitor. Okay, we're ready to go into executive session. Motion to enter into executive session under 4246-5A1, discussion of personnel, police chief, notice sent. Second. All those in favor of that motion, raise your right hand. Remain in executive session under 4246-5A2, collective bargaining, the police, AFSCME, and IAFF. Second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. And continue under 4246-5A2 litigation. Second. <laughs> All those in favor of that motion, raise your hand. And once again, continue under 4246-5A5, possible acquisition or disposition of real estate. Second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, we're in executive session.